Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. G. Marshall. Have you ever paused to wonder what happens to famous people when fame is wrenched away? Consider this. To singers, actors, dancers, to all who perform on stage before live audiences, applause is their life's blood. To performers, that sound is the music of the spheres. They live on it, thrive on it. Feed on it. But when homage fades, dies away into silence, what then? Some accept retirement gracefully, or seem to, as did a world renowned ballerina until her 50th birthday. I will pay anything, everything, to be young, to dance again. I warn you, the cost will be high. And before we go on, I give you one last chance. Not to go on. You are here of your own free will. You still have free will. Decide. Do you still wish to collaborate with me? If yes, then there is no turning back. What do you say? Alexandra, yes or no? mystery drama, Give the Devil His Due, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Nancy Moore and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Alexandra incomparable ballerina, toast of two continents, Alexandra the Unsurpassed. It was said of her dancing that she was more than a star flung from the heavens. She was a constellation. What? What is wrong? What happened to my applause? Where is it, my applause? The bravos. I can't hear them. Please applaud. 
Call my name. What is wrong? Sandra. W- wake up, Sandra. With applause. Where did it go, please? Wake please, up. Please. I want my applause. That lovely sound. Someone has taken it away. Darling, darling, wait, wake up. Where? 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 There now. That's right. John. Yes, dear, it's John. You were dreaming. I was dreaming. Yes, a bad dream. But you where awake am, now? Where am I? What am I doing in this place? Andrew, you're home. Now, come on, back to bed. I'm all mixed up. Come on now, take my hand. I'm so cold. Of course you are. That thin nightgown dancing around the room. Oh, my head, it aches so. Oh, there now, that's my good girl. You'll feel better in a minute. Swan Lake. Huh? I danced Swan Lake. Oh, in the, in the dream, yeah? Yes. What dream? What are you talking about? I danced Swan Lake last night. And such applause, John. I can't remember how many curtain calls. And the flowers. There were never so many. Sandra. Brava, Alexandra, brava. And one young man was calling out, I love you, I love you. And after the seventh encore, no. or was it the eighth? Sandra, stop it. Stop it right now. John, what has happened to you? You've always been so proud of my talent, my fame. And lately, you seem actually jealous of it. Alexandra, will you listen to me? You did not dance last night. You will not dance tonight. You haven't danced for 13 years since you retired. You're 50 years old. I am not 50 years old. Why do you say such things? Why have you turned on me like this? Oh, Sandra, dear Sandra, you're ill. It, it, it began a week ago on your 50th birthday. Well, you stop again. that. I am not 50. I am not. That's exactly what you said on your birthday. You screamed it. You, you knocked the cake off. The I am table. not 50. I am not. I am not. Where are you going? Now get your hammer. What? You look at yourself. Something you refuse to do all week. No, no. All right, then. If you can, tell me you're not 50 years old. There. Well, go ahead, look. No! Don't turn away. Look. I won't. Yes, you will. Please don't do that. You're hurting me. There will be marks on my arm. They will show in my costume tonight. All right, open your eyes and I'll let you go. There. Good. <laughs> now tell me what you see. I see beautiful Alexandra. The greatest ballerina the world has ever known. Oh, stop looking past the mirror. Look into it. Look. No, that's not me. That is someone else. She is ugly. Oh, so ugly. Take her away. No, she's not ugly. She's still very beautiful. But she is 50. Face it, Sandra. Face yourself. Why do you make me face it? Why? I hate what I am. Then you, you do know what you are. You know. Sometimes I know. But I don't want to. I want to go back. To go back. Darling, you can't go back. You can't live in the past. This is now. I hate now. But it exists and you're part of it. Yes, John, you are right. Of course you are. You listen, Daniel. You, you heard me. Understood. I listened. I heard. Now, will you do the same for me? Listen? Oh, certainly. I've known what's been going on this past week. Part of my mind has always known. I've tried to blot out the truth, pretended it is lies, and sometimes I can't do it. But you, you drag me back. How cruel. Just now, in the mirror, with the wrinkles. Sandra, I don't want to hurt you, but I can't let you go on like this. You're getting... Deeper and deeper into this pretense. I, I, I don't know where it'll lead. Thank God we've talked about it honestly. And tomorrow, we'll talk more. Now, let's try to get some sleep. No. I haven't finished. There's something I haven't told you. 
You say, I need to know that I am 50, that I can't dance, that I will never dance again. Well, you need to know that I will dance. I will. Oh, Zan. I know it sounds impossible to you, even mad. I know you can't believe it, but it is true. Alexandra, the unsurpassed, will dance again. All right, Zandra. Will you promise me something? All right. I'll stop talking about it. But that does not change what will be. No, no, no. I want you to talk about it. What? To a doctor. To a psychiatrist. I see. Please, darling, I beg you, this... This is madness, what you're saying. You're, you're, you're headed straight for a breakdown. Do you think so, John? Well, there's been plenty of evidence, and now this. But I think it can be prevented. Very well, then. I shall see a doctor. Yes. I certainly will. You will? Tomorrow... Mr. Stern, I want the truth. Please, don't make promises you cannot keep. But I have no intention of doing that, Mrs. Scott. What would be gained by you or me? Aside from that, it is an honor to have the great Alexandra come to me for help. I have simply come to the best doctor in the profession. Now, exactly what can you do for me? First, you must understand there is no absolute guarantee. None. Plastic surgery will make you look younger. That is absolute. But for exactly how many years is speculative? However, I can make a very educated guess. You have fine bone structure. And that is basic to all beauty. Bones don't change. Only the skin, the muscles... When your skin is smooth again, wrinkles gone, loose flesh tightened, eyelids no longer sagging, oh, 15 to 20 years, I think, Mrs. Scott. That's a lot of years, I know, but I believe I can achieve it. 20 years? I will be 20 years old again. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. 15 to 20 years off your present age. Oh, how silly of me to put it that way. In other words, I would look 30. Oh, 30, 35. I suppose that will have to do. Now, about my body. You want body surgery as well? Of course. You can do the same thing for my body. Oh, Mrs. Scott, no, no. Age takes a toll of the body we cannot change. Ah, yes. Breasts lifted, superfluous fat removed... But if you mean your entire body made firm and beautiful... That is precisely what I mean. My dear lady, be realistic. Only magic could accomplish such a thing. Magic. Yes. Good morning, Dr. Stern. I am sorry for taking so much of your time. What is the lady's wish? Her fortune in the tarot cards... The palm or the crystal ball? I think the crystal ball. The lady has chosen well. And please, please, I am in a hurry. Something troubles you very deep. We will begin. My hands upon the crystal. Oh, it's most strange what I see... I see you young, young and beautiful. Tell me. Tell me if I am dancing. Tell me. You, you, the, the crystal grows cloudy. The mist, I, I can see no more. Gone, all gone. But I have told you true. You will be young again. Please, please try again. I must know if I will dance. Carlotta has no power to see what her crystal ball does not wish to reveal. But you have other powers. You know ancient magic. Can you make me young? Tell me, does the lady fear a witch 
I don't fear anything except age and not dancing again. Send me to her. The witch is a man, a warlock. But, lady, beware the cost. I don't care what it costs. Tell me his name. He wears many names, many faces. What name today, what face, I do not know, but I do know where he dwells. Number 13, Gehenna Street. The door knocker. It's hideous. Gargoyle. Never mind that. Just knock. That sound. It's like doom. There is still time to run back down this crooked street. No, I will not. There is still time to run back down the crooked street, Madam Scott. You know my name. Your true name is Alexandra. I've been expecting you. My house is honored. How strange this room is. Uh, Don't be alarmed by my treasures. They are ancient symbols of the occult. I am not alarmed. I am only surprised. Since you expected me, sir, and you know my name, you must also know my need. Your quest, your heart's desire. Yes, yes, I know. Can you do it? Not can I, but will I? Then will you? If, and only if you agree to my terms, I warn you, they are costly. To be young... To dance again, there is nothing I wouldn't pay. And now, since we are here to do business, I should know your name. You haven't told me. Well, my name, for a while, as long as it amuses me, is Azazel. Azazel? I've never heard that name before. That may prove to be your loss. Well, I have heard it now. So can we... Get started, please. Uh, Not yet. Not yet. Before we go on, I give you one last chance not to go on. You are here of your own free will. You still have free will. Decide. Do you still wish to collaborate with Azazel? If yes, then there is no turning back. What say you, Alexandra... Yes or no? Yes, Mr. Azazel. Yes. Azazel. If Zandra Scott, a correction, if Alexandra had remembered Milton's Paradise Lost, she would recall that Azazel is the name of a fallen angel who, with Satan, rebelled against heaven. And perhaps she would have run for her life down the crooked street. We will return to that street shortly with Act Two. It was Daniel Defoe who wrote, Every devil does not have a cloven foot, nor has Azazel. If devil he is, we can't be certain, can we? He may very well be only a charlatan, preying on the gullibility of foolish, vain people who wander down his crooked street. However, this I can tell you with certainty. Azazel is devilishly handsome. And wasn't it Shakespeare who wrote, The Prince of Darkness is a gentleman? So seems Azazel, genial, courtly, charming, Madam, will you sit here? Why, it's a kind of throne. And what more appropriate for Alexandra? Oh, how lovely it is to hear you call me that. Nobody does anymore. They call me Sandra. Mm-hmm. Now, Mr. Azazel... No, no, me. please, please. I dislike Mr. Azazel is enough. Azazel. Such an odd name. But I like it. I'm flattered. Now, you were about to ask what price I demand to make you young. Twenty. 
that's the age I want. Now, what if I said I'd take your husband from you? John, I wouldn't care. No? Your fortune? I quote you. Money, it's nothing to me. <laughs> How charmingly we agree. But I'm saying neither of those things. Merely testing you. All I require of you now is your promise that you will indeed pay anything. Anything I should ask. <laughs> You'll learn the cost only after your transformation. Are you uh, willing to enter a pact so blindly? Yes, yes, yes. Well, how swiftly you leap. Like a ballerina. <sighs> but consider, my lady. Consider... Azazel may demand more than you care to pay. What have I to lose? I have nothing I care about. Nothing. Very well. Your promise, state it. I promise I will give... I promise I will give anything, everything, to be young, to dance as I danced when I was truly Alexandra. Don't make me wait any longer. Change me. Hurry. Here, this moment. Yes. A greedy, impatient Alexandra. The metamorphosis will be done my way, in my time, not yours. Three nights must pass. The morning after the third night, you will be Alexandra. I must wait three whole nights. Well, Thirty years you've waited to be twenty again. You can wait three nights more, surely. Now... Each night, you will drink from this bottle. How much of it? <laughs> you require a label. as on ordinary medicine bottles for very well. Uh, shake well before using. Three tablespoons before bedtime. Prescription not refillable. Now you're laughing at oh, me. Indeed, no, no. I'm laughing at other people who, who take only man-made potions. Now, all is uh, understood? Yes. Give it to me. No, not, not, not so fast. Not quite all is understood. One more promise. On the morning of the third day, you will come here down the crooked street. Go nowhere else first. You will come to Azazel to pay what you will pay. Give me your promise. Yes, yes, I promise. Excellent. And I give you the magic potion. <laughs> Sandra, what are you taking? What's in that funny-looking bottle? Oh, it's medicine, John. Oh, what for? Well, I'm, I'm not feeling quite myself. You're not? Well, isn't that what you have been saying for a week? Oh, yes, but I didn't know psychiatrists prescribe medicine. But how silly you are. Of course they do. Tranquilizers, things like that. Oh, oh, yes. And you do seem better already. Yes, I am much. All evening, not one word about... No, no, I, 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 don't, I don't want to get you started. About being young again? About how I will dance again? Oh, Zandra, please don't start. All right. Turn off the light, darling. A dancer needs a full night's sleep. Oh, Sandra, you said that with humor and a, and a smile, and you know it's a joke. You are getting back to normal. Yes, back to normal. Good night, John. John, John, wake up. Oh, please. John. What time is it? It's six. Six? What, what the devil are you waking me up at six o'clock for? Because I want to know if I... Well, how do I look this morning? How you look? Yes, that medicine last night. The doctor said... Well, he said take it and you'd, you'd feel better, didn't he? Do you? Uh, yes. Yes, of course, but I thought... I just got a notion that I might look better, too. Do I, John? You look rested, 
and very pretty. And there's a light in your eyes you haven't had for a long time. And I think your doctor is a genius. We might even say a magician. John. Mm. John. Mm -hmm. It's nearly seven o'clock. Sir. Oh. Sandra, what has gotten into you? We, we never open an eye until 8.30 or 9. Now, two mornings running. You... What? John, John, John. How do I look? Sandra, what is it you want me to say? I told you... Sandra. What? Sandra, are you taking some kind of... of... Youth restoring quack medicine, is that what you're up to? I am taking what the doctor told me to take. And yes, I did hope it would make me look better. I mean, all week I've had such worry lines, so tense, so nervous. That's all. I just wanted to look better. That doctor, you never call him by name. Why? Well, it is such an odd name, it's hard to say. Just what is this doctor's name? It is Dr... Azazel. Azazel? What nationality is that? How do I know? And I certainly didn't ask. Now, Sandra, listen to me. Something's wrong. There's something phony here. What do you know about this doctor's credentials, about his... Where are you going? Do you mind to wash my teeth? I can't stand this awful bitter taste. Oh, the mirror... Look at me. Nothing has changed. Is something wrong? Are there telephony? Is he... Sandra, I can't hear what you... I can't hear you. No, I was just looking at myself. And I can't bear it. Oh, darling, please don't start all that again. Oh, you old woman staring at me. I love you. Sandra, what on earth happened in here? It's nothing. It's nothing, John. It doesn't matter. I broke the mirror. By accident. <laughs> Sandra, you awake? Oh, what time is it? Still dark. Oh, well, that blasted lighter. Oh, not quite six, damn. Sandra's got me in a habit of waking. Honey, it's not fair. You sleep while I... Oh, my God. Oh, my God! Sandra, what's happened to you? Hmm? Sandra, wake up! Uh, what? Oh, would, you, uh, would you please, for God's sake, open your eyes? John. John, what on earth are you shouting? John. Have I changed? Am I different? Different? Answer me. I am afraid to go and look. Go! Go, look! Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I don't, don't believe this. Just to... now... When I got out of bed, it was not my heavy 50-year-old body. Will you get to the mirror? This can't be. Oh. Am I mad or, or do you look the way I think you look? Oh, I am 20 years old. I am Alexandra. 20? In the name of heaven, will you explain to me how this could happen? Yes, it is the medicine. It was a magic potion given me by a warlock, a witch, Azazel. No, you are not dreaming. You are not mad. I am exactly what you see. He has given me back my true self. Please, John, no more arguments. I am going now. Zandra, this is goodbye. Zandra, one last time. No. Undo this unnatural, unholy thing before it's too late. You are too late. There is no turning back, even if I wanted to. Wait! Once you leave this apartment, walk out that door. Once you'll... I leave this apartment, I am free. Where will you go? Where else would I go? To the most famous of all ballet companies. To Sergius Kerensky, 
ballet master and old friend. Oh, Zandra, you see how mixed up you are. Sergius managed you 30 years ago. He's dead. Oh, how could I forget that? You see, come back in and close the door. Oh, don't be stupid, John. It is his son's company now. Peter Kerensky. I will go to him. He doesn't know it. But this is the luckiest day of his life. And mine. Goodbye, old man. Sandra! I am free. It is the luckiest day of my life. On the morning of the third day, you will come here, down the crooked street. You will go nowhere else first. You will come to Azazel to pay what you will pay. But I have paid, Azazel. I lost poor old John and his silly old money. Why should I go down your crooked street again? Do not play fast and loose with promises made here. It will be at your peril. But Azazel, <laughs> Mr. Azazel, Dr. Azazel... All this abacadabra was done so that I could dance. I can't bear to waste another minute. I am terribly sorry. But I have an appointment with Peter Kerensky. It was Cervantes who wrote, He needs must go, whom the devil drives. But, uh... Is that quotation appropriate here? Is it the devil who drives Alexandra? We still do not know who Azazel is. To her, he's only a sorcerer. And with the arrogance of newfound youth, she now dares defy him. It may well be that by not keeping her pact with Azazel, Alexandra is traveling down another crooked street. A dead-end street. We'll follow her when I return shortly with Act 3. This is a public service message from the Chemotherapy Foundation. This is WBBM Chicago. Backward, turn backward, O oh time in your flight. Can the clock be turned back? Can youth be relived? It would seem so. But is it wise to reach for the past? Finding it, may we not live it worse instead of better? Alexandra, age 20 again, has billed herself to Peter Kerensky as Zandra Scott. Curious that she should send in that name. Curious, too, that Kerensky agrees to see her. As a rule, he is not interested in unknown young dancers. Zandra Scott, is that right? That is the name I am using just now, Mr. Krensky. Oh, you have another? A name you would recognize if I told it to you. Well, then uh, why the secrecy? No, it is not secrecy. You will know exactly who I am when you see me dance. Now, see here, I'm not sure I'm amused by such games. And why are you so sure I will give you an audition? I know, that's all. I am absolutely certain. Well, yeah, that's more than I am. I can't think why he even let you in here. Perhaps because I am a relative of the great Alexandra. Are you? But I didn't know that when your name was sent in. Aha, uh -huh, you knew it intuitively. Oh, come now. Well, at least I know why you looked familiar when you walked in. There's a very strong resemblance to Alexandra. Quite remarkable, really. So you remember how she looked? My dear lady, how could I forget... My father left a collection of at least a thousand photographs of that incredible face. You keep staring at me, Mr. Krensky. Yes, you know, it's uncanny. More and more, I see her face in yours. Um, are you her daughter? Alexandra had no children. Or a niece, then. Again, Mr. Krensky. You will know who I am when you see me dance. Oh, no wonder you were sure I'd audition you. What fool would refuse any relative of Alexandra's? I did rather count on that. Yes, but it's not like me to waste time this way. Let's get on with it, please. You've brought leotard and toe slippers in that bag, yes, I assume? Yes, yes. Well, I'll get hold of the practice pianist. What music, ma'am? Giselle, the mad scene. Why, that's one of the most difficult... 
Isn't that rather ambitious of you? For some ballerinas, yes. For this one, though. I have danced that role many times. Uh Uh-huh. As you will. Oh, uh, that door just to your left. You can dress in there. Then come on stage. I'll be waiting out front with my assistant. But why should I audition for anyone but you? Because I want it that way. How much warm-up will you need? None. None? I shall be ready in five minutes. Oh, oh. vain as a peacock. But if you're as good as you think you are, then why not? Wait until you see her, Trina. Oh, the reincarnation of Alexandra? Well, that's the feeling I have. Oh, well, if she has half Alexandra's talent, a quarter of it, but she's a fine. A real beauty, too. Eyes like... Oh, there she is in the wings. Oh, Peter... She could be Alexandra's twin. What did I tell you? You ready, Miss Scott? I have always been ready. Oh. Very well. Music. Begin. Now, you vain, lovely creature, let's see what you can do. Fool should have had a warm up. All right, all right. I expected a slow start, but come on, let's see something. I don't believe this. What's going on up there? Wait, Peter, give her a chance. I am, I am. I will be damned. What is that? It's nothing. No elevation, no extension, no technique, whatever. Not even any grace. This girl's clumsy. That is a trained dancer. Well, she's a rank amateur. Did she really think she could put this over on Kerensky? A chance resemblance to Alexandra, and she palms herself off as a relative. Oh, she couldn't have a teaspoon of Alexandra's blood. Damn little upside trick me. Does she really believe she can dance? All right, cut, cut. That's enough. Why? Why did you stop me? Uh, come down here, please, Miss Scott. Trina, this girl's out of her mind. I- I'd better handle this alone. Wait for me in the office, please. Thin ice, Peter. Handle with care. I know, I know. How could you do such a thing? I was just beginning the marvelous dramatic passage. Could I yes, try? yes, I-, I know, but, uh, uh, I'm terribly sorry, but I don't think you're quite ready for that just yet. Not ready. Miss Scott. Do you think you're ready? My experience, my talent, how could I not be ready? You actually think you danced well up there? You believe that? I I didn't. Indeed, you did not. But I felt so marvelous in the music and the stage. I was Giselle. It all came back to me as if I were... Mr. Kerensky, what are you saying to me? I'm saying you're not ready for this company, or any company for that matter. No, no, please. You don't understand. I came here too soon. I should have trained. I thought I didn't need to, but I... Mr. Kerensky, I have not danced for some time. I did not realize I would be so rusty. Any real dancer knows she has to practice every day of her life. But I didn't think that I had to. But I will go, and I will train, Uh, and I will be back. Miss Scott, please, I'm a busy man. You've had your audition. It's over. Don't bother to come back. I'd be less than kind to encourage you. Now, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but you simply have no talent. How dare you say that to me? How dare you claim you're related to Alexandra? If by some mischance you are, you blight that famous name. No, I am not related to her. So you admit it. I am Alexandra. I am Alexandra. Wait, wait. You fool. You tell me I have no talent. I who danced with Nijinsky. Oh, my poor child. Nijinsky died before you were born. So, 
You have come. What have you done to me? Why have you done it? Come, come, be an Alexandra. I am not Alexandra. I am nothing. Why did you do it? Why did you break your promise to come here? There was no need to keep it. I paid what you wanted. You have not paid. You went your own foolish way. That was your gratitude to the one who made you young and fair. I am young again, yes. But my body, it won't obey me. Can you say that you didn't do that? If you had kept your promise, you would have kept your talent. And I must ask you to stop shouting. It offends me. I want to go now. I don't like it Not so fast, Alexandra. It may be I shall reconsider what I have done. Huh? If... You are still willing to give everything in return. But I have already given everything. No. I don't know what else you want. But I don't care whatever it is. You take it, you take it all. And let me dance. (laughs) The bargain is struck. You shall dance. As I used to. Far better than that. But you shall dance to my tune. Look into my face, Alexandra. Oh... What do you see? You. You. Who am I? Oh. Oh, you know my name? Say it. No. You've known me from the beginning. If you thought of anyone except yourself. Oh. Are you ready to dance? Now. Here. Now. Here. A kind of rehearsal. You could call it that. But in these clothes, I can't... Ah, the first change, then. Look upon yourself, Alexandra. What? It is my costume for the sleeping beauty and my ballet slippers, everything. An appropriate costume, yes. Have you not been sleeping? Huh? But now... The prince has awakened you. Alexandra, may I have this dance? Dance with... With... A pas de deux with the devil himself. You are highly honored. But can the devil dance? (laughs) You will find that Nijinsky was an ox compared to me. Oh, that I don't believe. You doubt that Satan can do anything he desires. Music! Come, come, your hand... Alexandra, you dance like, like an angel. Yes, I know. I feel it. Never before like this. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, now I will conquer the world again. No. What do you mean, no? You promised me. My promise will be kept. As you have kept yours. You promised to give everything. At this precise moment, you have. What have I given? The world. You've lost it. Alexandra will dance forever. But only in limbo with Satan. Warning. The devil will have his due. To those who refuse to heed that warning, let them learn from the fate of Alexandra. Oh, yes, she realized her ambition. We can accurately say her burning ambition. But until the end of time, the flames of hell will lap at her dancing feet. I'll be back shortly. There is a fresh new spirit sweeping the land. A free spirit that demands good products. don't believe in the devil there is no such evil being 
then a final warning needs to be sounded here. In the too often ignored words of Baudelaire, the devil's cleverest wile is to persuade us that he does not exist. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Joe Silver, Ian Martin, Bryna Rayburn, and Peter Donald. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You want me to do something else, don't you? Of course. You admit it. Oh, sure. We don't have a budget for the Santa Claus suit. So I thought if you'd be him, you could afford to rent it. Where are you going? I'm opening the door for you to leave, Jezebel. My name isn't Jezebel. That's a matter of opinion. Just keep heading for the front door. Then you won't be Santa Claus? I'm afraid I'm not the type. You could be just perfect if you'd let yourself go. I wish I could believe that. Oh, couldn't you? Only one way I could. Well, how's that? You get me the Santa Claus suit, and if you still want me, I'll be your Santa Claus. Honest to Pete? Honest to Pete. Well, I'll try, but it's going to take a miracle if I do. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. down for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight, the science fiction classic, Knock, by Frederick Brown. Tonight we have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock at the door. What's that? Good morning, man. What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Who are you? I am Zan. I'm still asleep, I must be. You are not asleep. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. No. I guess I'm awake. Who... What are you? I am a Zan. What's that? A Zan is intelligent life. Look, I don't... What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet seven? But you mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. What are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. 
You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes, that is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. How about the people? What about the population of the world? You are the population of the world. Hmm? Now, wait a minute. I, I can't... I don't understand what's happened. The Zan have landed on your planet. We have removed the lower life forms to prepare for colonization by the Zan. When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. What? Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh, I'm uh, Walter Phelan, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Nathan University. How do you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language. It is a primary type of auditory communication. Oh. Is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What would you want further in your room? Do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. You better bring me my books. Uh, that will is... be done. That's rather considerate of you. You know, I've got to call you something. Do you mind if I call you George? It is immaterial. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. Oh, that's all right, George. Just uh, call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George. I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. <laughs> George. Hello, Walter. Uh, wait a minute, you're not George. You're different somehow. It makes no difference. The Zan are many, and they are one. Then I'll call you George, too. I'll call you all George. Uh, what can I do for you? Point one. You will please henceforth sit with your chair facing the other way. Uh-huh, I thought so, George. That plain wall is different from the other side, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm in a zoo, right? That is correct. How many other animals do you have in the zoo, George? 216. <laughs> Not complete, George. Even a bush league zoo could beat that. Did you just uh, pick at random? Yes. All species would have been too many. Male and female, each of 108 kinds. Male and female, huh? Of uh, all the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Mm, anyone I know? Uh, well, never mind. It doesn't matter anyway. Well, uh, what do you feed us all, eh? For carnivorous species, we make synthetics. The flora was not hurt by the vibrations which destroyed animal life. Oh, nice for the flora. Well, George, you started out with point one. I deduce there is a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Oh? Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. They are cold. Don't worry, George. It happens in the best regulated zoos. What is wrong with them, Walter? Nothing much. They're just dead. Dead? Mm hmm. That means stopped. But nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Well, maybe they just died of old age. Old age? I do not understand. You don't? How old are you, George? Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I am still young. Yeah, a babe in arms. Look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. Here on Earth, we've got somebody you don't know where you come from. An old man with a beard and an hourglass and a scythe. Your vibrations didn't kill him. What is he? Oh, old man death. Down here, our people and animals live until somebody, the Grim Reaper, stops them. He will stop more? He gets us all, George. With your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute and we'll all be gone. <laughs> Looks like you made a mistake, George. And I don't think there's much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zan is a logical being. We will take action. Well, George, uh, where are you taking me? We will be there shortly. We will bring your books and your chair. You mean my lease is up? I, I do not understand. It's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Go 
Go inside. Oh, be careful with those books, George. Don't lose my... Oh, uh, excuse me. Who are you? What are you doing here? I guess George didn't explain. Uh, George uh, tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What's all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why, but uh, let's go back a bit. Do you know just what has happened otherwise? No, not exactly. Well, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart, anyway. There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of an advanced scouting party. I saw their spaceship. It's as big as a mountain. Yeah, they're moving in on us. They cleaned off the Earth with some kind of vibration. It destroys all sorts of animal life. I don't know whether they did it all at once or if they had to circle the Earth a few times, but they killed everybody. No. I was afraid that... The cheerful note is that you and I and uh, 200-odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You do know this is a zoo, don't you? I suspected it. But I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. Well, my hunch is they used the vibrations just low enough to knock us all out. And then they cruised around, picking up samples at random. When they were all set, they turned the juice on full blast. How terrible. Yeah, well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing shortage, wars, even the atomic bomb. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. Only they made a mistake. They underestimated us. I don't understand. (laughs) They thought we were immortal. That we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can be killed, but the Zans don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are are more than two of us? Oh, not more of our species, no. These were merely fellow animals, a rabbit and a canary. And by the Zans way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece. It's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in the zoo. Well, didn't they even know we'd all die eventually? I don't think so. Uh, George, that is the, the second Zan I saw, told me he was 7,000 years old, and he's young by their standards. When they learned how quickly we die, they, they were practically shocked to the core, if they have cores. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment. I learned it at faculty tees. At any rate, they've decided to reorganize their zoo. Two by two. What, are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? Yeah, I'm afraid so. There's plenty of furniture, though, and George promised to bring me my chair. But we've got to do something. Why? Well, I don't know. It just, just seems to me we ought to the human race to do something. Oh, well, uh, perhaps you have a suggestion? There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I've been studying them. They look horribly different, but I think they have about the same metabolic and digestive system as we. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. But you said 7,000 years. Yeah, I, I, I think I figured it out. Now, George cut his, uh, I suppose you'd call it his hand, when he brought in my books. Started to bleed, red blood. But I could see the cut closing as he stood there. By the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Well, you see, whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zan. Their regenerative powers must be unlimited. They just don't wear out. They go on and on until they're stopped. Suppose we killed one. There must be some way. Oh. What would be the use? They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put up a sign saying, Beware of the man. Dangerous. I don't think they'll even have to bother in your case. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. It just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife. She died two years ago. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, not at all. It was a pleasure. Uh, that'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Point one, I have brought your books. Mm-hmm, point one, eh? Uh, what else is on your mind? Another creature sleeps and will not wake. Oh? A small feathered one called a duck. Well, it happens, George. I warned you. Old man death, the grim reaper. I told you about him. Walter, the Council of Zan has met. It has been decided logically that, A, no life form can withstand the full strength vibrations with which we cleared your planet. Therefore, the Grim Reaper you spoke of does not exist. Mm, Pretty neat, George. What's B? B, the only intelligent life to escape the vibrations, is you. Therefore, the logical conclusion is you are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you are off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. You've got me. Yes, we have. It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get the information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. This means you, Walter, 
And the female. Now, hold on, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Uh, let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. This is the weasel. Now, yeah, you should have got him in the winter, George. The fur's worth more than it's ermine. This is the reptile cage. Mm-hmm. Here are the ducks. That is the male. The female has been stopped. Yeah, lucky girl. What's the matter, fellow? Lonely? Hmm? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. Well, you got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us now how it is done. I've told you, George. I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well. We will have to take further action. Oh, what are you going to do, George? We will go back now to your room. <laughs> What happened, Mr. Phelan? Uh, you might call me Walter. After all, George does. And we have more in common. Please, what happened? Oh, just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He wants me to tell him how. Did you? Look, I'm just an ordinary anthropologist. There's no telling what those animals died of. Just natural causes. But George can't see it that way. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. Hmm? What? At least we can get back at them some way. At least we can do something to them. Well, why, after all, George isn't a bad fellow... If you like an ant mentality. How can you say that? Well, they murdered the whole in the human race. I suppose so, but uh, we can't change that now, so why think about it? We just can't sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. But at least we could be fighting. I can't see the virtue in that. I was more or less content with my books, and we've got George to talk to. Of all the men in the world they had to pick... Don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting to the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? can't really explain it, but, Walter, if there was any good in man, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and, in the end, even against himself. He kept on fighting for what he thought was right, and we're all that's left. Walter, we, we just can't end by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You know, you do remind me of Martha. There isn't much left for us. We could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend there's a secret about death. We could refuse to tell them anything. Well, there isn't anything to tell. But they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. Well, I suppose the worst they can do is kill us. All right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now you will tell us how these animals are stopped. George, this may come as a shock to you, but I've decided not to tell you. Why? Oh, a romantic attachment to lost causes... My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. Neither was my grandfather. He charged a Yankee battery with one round of ammunition and a corncob pipe. You are not logical, but that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Go now, Walter. You won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight, Walter. Remember that. We've got to go out fighting. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Go now, Walter. Goodbye. It's uh, been a pleasure, Miss Evans. I am waiting. Go now, Walter. After you, my dear George. You will tell us now, Walter. <laughs> that was the first level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now, how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. <laughs> You are still conscious. Let me alone, George. You will tell us now. You will tell us now how you stop the animals. Let me alone. Let me alone. We have had vibration levels one and two. There are still 15 more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, no, no. Let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. It's tough. You better start vibrating again, George. 
No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. Let me go? That is correct. Oh, that's uh, real nice of you, George. I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. No, no, no George, George, you can't do that. No, listen, George. George, there is no secret. Can you understand that? There is no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal cage next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. Uh, the animal... Animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, no, no. no, no. Listen, George. You want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped? You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you now. I, I give up. But you've got to promise to leave the woman alone. You promise, George? If we receive the answer from you, Walter, there will be no further need for the vibrations. Well, I guess that'll have to do. All right. All right. Take me to that stopped animal. I'll tell you how to save the mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. Walter, are you all right? Just uh, let me catch my breath a minute. What did they do? What happened? After a while, I told them what they wanted to know. Oh, no. As uh, George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. But you promised. I know. It was our last chance to beat them on even one little thing. Well, perhaps. You mind if I sit down? You gave up. Well, I suppose you could call it that. I'm very tired. They've beaten us completely, then. There isn't even anything we can do. The last of the human race, and we give up. We don't even die fighting. Oh, it isn't that bad. Uh, something might turn up, Martha. What did you call me? Uh, uh, huh? No, I, I must have said Martha. Sorry, she was my wife. She died two years ago. What were you saying? Nothing, nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. It's too late for the whole human race. What now, George? The council of the Zan has met. No? Something wrong, George? A Zan has been stopped. What? A Zan is dead? That is correct. Well, you didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zan. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Walter. No, no, you've got it wrong, George. The council has decided. This time you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter, what did they do to you? Oh, they, uh, they have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes. And I... I thought... Oh, Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to, to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man, Walter. No, not very. There isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? Now, Walter. Wait. Hmm? What's that? I have been told another Zan has died. Uh, now, now will you believe me? Council of the Zan meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you, it's old man death. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. What now? The council has decided. This is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the Zan. Oh, Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George. And uh, don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the Earth now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, George. Board now. It's so wonderful to feel the sun and the wind again. Yeah, they've closed the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Yes, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this, Grace. The Zan leaving Earth forever. They're blasting off. 
there they go. Yes, it's all over now. Well, I suppose we might as well go back in. I, I still don't understand. Walter, what made them go? <laughs> well, I just, uh, I just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know. At 7,000 years, he was going to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Look out for the step. Well, uh, you remember when the first animals died? The rabbit and the duck? Yeah, and their mates just started to pine and waste away? Yes. Well, that worried the Zan. They wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. So, finally, I broke down and told them about affection. Affection? Yes. And then I introduced Donald. Donald? Who's that? Here we are. Grace, meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please, what does affection have to do with it? That's what the Zan wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. That having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Hmm? <laughs> I even showed him how. Here, fella, come on. Come here. Yeah. I held Donald in my arms, and I petted him a while. Then I let the Zan take over with the animal in the next cage. What animal? Take a look. You mean this cage? Mm-hmm. Watch out. Don't go too close. Walter, it's a rattlesnake. Yeah, yes. Their metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch that they could be poisoned. Well, then it was the snake that killed the two Zan. Mm-hmm. They never even knew what bit them. Then you outwitted them, Walter. Well, I, I suppose... I you... thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so ashamed. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought if you hadn't pushed me. Well, I... Well, we've got a world to plan. A new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to let out of the zoo and which ones are to be safer to keep in. But first, there's a bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. We've got to make a decision about that. Pretty important one. We... Yes, but... It's been a nice race. Even if nobody won it. Of course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. No! It's the Garden of Eden all over again. Uh, but Eve, you'll have to watch out for that snake. Now, don't. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. You know, funny, you, you even blush like Martha. Only uh, you're stronger than she was. Prettier, too. I, I, I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear. If you'll give me time. Now, Walter Phelan, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that I... Well, that I we thought could... it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. So, Grace, if you could only... No! I wouldn't marry you if, if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going out. All right, my dear, but think it over. And please come back. <laughs> You see, I told you, it wasn't really so horrible, our story. Remember how it goes? The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then there was a knock on the door. Come in. Come in, Grace. My dear. You see, it wasn't horrible at all. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription... X-1 has brought you Knock by Frederick Brown, adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Alex Scorby as Walter, Laurie March as Grace, and Louis Van Ruten as the Zan. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Now, next week. (laughs) 
A strange and chilling story from the Bureau of Missing Persons. The story of what occurred when they accidentally intercepted a shortwave message. A cry for help from a missing atomic scientist who told them the fantastic story that he was now the man in the moon. How did it happen? You'll hear next week at X minus one. It's mystery time. Time now for the best in mystery. Tonight, on Masters of Mystery, an exciting melodrama titled Death Walked In. Get away from that phone or I'll kill you. You're bluffing, Julie. I know you are. You are wrong, Ed. I wasn't bluffing. Good evening. This is Don Dowd, your host for Mystery Time, back again to introduce another in ABC Radio's great Monday through Friday lineup of mystery dramas. Every night at this time, a new and different story. Our drama tonight on Masters of Mystery was written by Joseph Ruskall and is titled Death Walked In. The action of our story covers the course of only a few days, but I think you'll agree with me that the moments are filled with emotional impact and suspense. So now, live on Masters of Mystery, Death Walked In. You know me, Ed Grimes, real estate. Respected. A solid citizen till this happened. Till death walked in. It doesn't always lurk in dark corners. It can come into your parlor like it did in the world. Hannah's and mine. It could be someone innocent looking, like the attractive young woman with books under her arm who rang our doorbell one afternoon. Yes? You're Mrs. Grimes? Yes, I'm Mrs. Grimes. Well, may I speak to you a moment? Uh, a friend of yours, Mrs. Tillingham, sent me. Oh, yes. Please come in. Thank you. I'm sorry I kept you waiting so long, but I'm simply morbid about answering the door when my husband's away. You say Mrs. Tillingham sent you? Oh, why, yes. You see, I just placed one of these valuable library editions in her home, and, well, she mentioned you as a likely prospect. Oh, you're selling something. Oh, no, absolutely nothing, Mrs. Grimes. We're practically giving it away. This complete set of encyclopedias, uh, just as you see them in this brochure. You see, we're giving them to special and selected families just for a limited time and as a special advertising campaign. No, 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 not today. Well, Thank practically you. nothing more than the price of the postage this complete, world-famous... But we already have a set of encyclopedias. You're... Oh, you're not from hereabouts, are you? No, I, I work town to town. I just arrived here. From where? Carterville. Carterville. Did you do well there? So, so. Oh, you look tired and cold. Come on into the living room and sit a while. Well, thank you. Can I make you a cup of tea, Miss uh, uh, Smith? Julie Smith. No, thanks. Oh. Oh, those gorgeous drapes. They're so right. So awfully right and so expensive. <laughs> How nice of you to say so, Miss Smith, but they're really not. Oh, what I wouldn't give for a home like this. But then I'd have to have a nice man to go with it, wouldn't I? To keep it up. Oh, say like that gentleman there on the grand piano. Oh, oh 
Oh, why, how observant you are. Yes, that's my husband's photograph. Uh, would you call him handsome? Not handsome, exactly, but strong and solid. Oh, will he be home soon? Looks like he's detained at his office. Well, perhaps if I came around tomorrow at this time. Well, I can't promise a thing. I'll ask him. But do come around anyway. We'll have a cup of tea. <laughs> Encyclopedias? Are you out of your mind, Hannah? Why do we need another set? We've got one. Nothing doing. Ed, dear, she'll hear you. Hear me? Where is she? In the kitchen. This is twice she's called now. Oh, my heart melts for that poor girl. She's had such a hard life, bringing up a large family, canvassing house to house. Oh, we just can't turn her away without a sale. It, it wouldn't be charitable. Darling, do you have to let in every stray alley cat that comes to the door? Now, Ed, don't talk that way. I... Shh, shh, here she comes. Oh, there you are, Julie. Uh, come and meet my husband. Ed, this is Miss Julie Smith. In reference to those books I was telling you about. <clears throat> How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Grimes? I feel I already know you from that picture on the piano. Now, Mr. Grimes, about the encyclopedias. <laughs> Eighty-five dollars. What made me do it? Shelling out eighty-five bucks when we've already got a set. No one forced you, Ed. You could have said no. Why did you do it? That's just it. I don't know. She looked at me and I... I don't know. Hmm, devil take her. Well, what's done is done. It's a good kind deed anyway. She's delivering the books to us tomorrow night. And when she comes... I want you to put a pleasant face on it and be civil to her. Please, Ed. Uh, would you like more tea? Oh, yes. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> My. Oh, those books look lovely. <laughs> of course, I have no idea where we're going to put them. <laughs> uh... Where do you live, Miss Smith? Well, I'm... I'm homeless at the moment, I'm afraid. My landlady locked me out. I, I owe rent. Oh. I, I'm not doing half as well as I did at Carterville. <coughs> if I could only find some place to stay tonight... You, you see, I'll have plenty of money tomorrow for my Carterville commission. <coughs> well, I think... Oh, I might go. Oh, thing. You have caught an awful cold. And now look... My husband's due home any minute, and I'm sure he won't mind a bit if you stay here with us for a few days. Here I am, Mrs. Grimes, back for marketing. Oh, and I got the most wonderful rose. Oh, Julie, you're an angel. But really, you shouldn't just because you're feeling all right again. I'm perfectly able No, no, you sit right where you are in your rocker and relax. I'll tend to these. Oh, oh, and here's your morning paper. You see, I didn't forget that either. You're a dear. Now, you just sit and read all the gossip and let me run this house. Oh, uh, did my luggage arrive? Mm, oh, just a while ago. I put it up in your room. A little only be for a few more days or so. Of course, if your husband doesn't think that... Oh, nonsense. You're perfectly welcome to stay a few days more, I'm sure. That... <gasps> Heaven. What's wrong? Oh, my gracious. In the very next town to listen to this, Carterville man confesses wife murder. In an astonishingly gruesome confession to police today, a Carterville merchant, Dudley C. Whipple, confessed oh. that... How was the murder discovered? Conscience. That's how it was discovered. Everyone thought his wife died a natural death. Then she was lying in her grave a whole week when suddenly her husband gets pangs of conscience and confesses she was poisoned. Did they live on 22 Elm Street, does it say? What? Yes. Yes, how'd you know? Oh, I, I sold them a set of books. You did? Why, that's right. You told me you were in that town for a while. Well, imagine. Poor Mrs. Whipple. She was such a nice lady and... 
she had such a lovely, lovely home. Oh, that cake for tonight. Uh, did you take it out of the oven? Yes, I did. Don't worry. Well, think of it. You actually sold that couple. Uh, of did cake. Mr. Grimes like the last cake I baked? Well, of course, dear. That's very kind of you to say so, but I know he dislikes me. He he resents my presence here, I know. Why, Julie, what makes you think so? Way he avoids me. Oh, no. He please. hates me. He wants me out of here. Yes, he does. Oh, Mrs. Grimes, I, I owe you so much, and I'm, I'm so grateful, but I just can't stay here the way he treats oh, me. nonsense. Mr. Grimes is just as happy as I am about this little temporary arrangement. And if he isn't civil to you, I'll tell him a thing or two. Do uh, you hear me, Julie? So, uh, what are you staring at? Parlor, Mrs. Grimes. You know, if you let me, I, I could really do things with it. This table here, for instance. I'd put it over there. That chair could go here. So much could be done. <laughs> my wife. At the dentist. She'll be back soon, Mr. Grimes. Hmm. Notice anything? Huh? Oh, hey. What? Is this my house? It's, it's different. Well, the whole room looks different. Well, who did it? I did. Oh, with your wife's consent. How do you like it? Oh, not bad. Well, not bad at all. It is better indeed it is. At last find a married man with an autistic eye. Oh, why married man? I don't know. They lose a sense of beauty somehow, and wives so often take their husbands for granted. I never would. You, you remind me of someone. Who? Oh. Man in Carterville. Why? I don't know. Oh, do you mind if I turn on the radio? No. Dance? If I were alone right now, you, you know what I'd do? No, what? Dance alone. I like to dance alone. You mind if I do anyhow? <laughs> Go ahead. Ah, oh, I like to dance. I love to dance around and around. You're very graceful, Julie. I'm young. He was a weakling, though. Who? Man in Carterville. You seem different. You don't like me, do you? What makes you think so? Why do you always avoid me? Never mind. I'll be leaving tomorrow. You will? Won't you be glad to get rid of me? You like to look at me, though, don't you? I've seen you looking at me. Like you are now. Just like you are now. Ed, think I'd make someone a nice wife? Ed, Julie came to me again in tears. With her suitcase all packed, she wanted to leave. Just because you've been behaving so brutally to her. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, that's what. Driving that poor girl to tears. What are you looking at, Ed? Me? Oh, I wonder why. But you look at me while you can. I'm leaving soon. Will you miss me when I'm gone? Please say you'll be nicer to her, Ed. Go out of your way the few more days she's here to make her feel at home. One of the family. Hannah, that girl must go. There's something about her, I tell you. I, I have a strange feeling that for some weird reason she's wormed her way into our home in order to... To what, dear? I don't know. It, it, maybe it's a premonition or something. I I think that when she rang the doorbell that time, some... Ed. Hannah, she's going to pack her bags and get out right now. <laughs> Here. 
is a nice lonely spot. Well, what are you waiting for? You wanted to tell me something. You started to up in my room. Took me out here. I wonder why. Kiss me. Julie. Julie. I knew it all the time. I knew it had come to this. I do things to you, don't I? The moment I first saw you, I could tell. <laughs> what if your frumpy old wife could see us now? Uh, shut up. I wonder what she'd say. Stop it, you <laughs> All right. I understand. You had to slap me because you're not used to this. What's happening to me? Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you want? You. Kiss me again. Julie, Julie. I knew you couldn't send me away. We're right for each other. I like you. You want me bad. Add it. Then subtract. All we've got to do is subtract it. You know what I mean. What are you talking about? Well, what do you take me for? Some cheap thing? Oh, no, Ed. I come expensive and my price is a wedding ring. Well, I'm a married man. I like married men. I want one. They've already got brick bungalows with lovely furnishings. I'd make you a real nice wife, Ed. Do you think I'd ever divorce her for you? I knew a man in Carterville said just that. He didn't like divorce either. But he wanted me bad. Real bad, like you. And in the end, there was another way. <laughs> you're the limit. Half the time, I don't know what you're, what you're raving about. I, you're so crazy. You, you're crazy wonderful. Come here. Hands off, please. Drive me to the station. What? I'm grabbing the first train out of town like I told you, wife. Now, kindly get started. Julie, you, you can't leave now. Why well, can't I? Because I can't let you... Know. No, 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 Julie, don't go now. Please, not now. Oh, Julie. That's better. I'll come back, sure. But you know what it means if I do, Ed. If I come back, it's on one condition. You'll have to get rid of her. Sooner or later. Some way or other. Oh, I declare, Mrs. State, that lively mind of yours. Ed and Julie, ridiculous. Oh, he positively dislikes her. He's hardly exchanged two words with her. Oh, that's the best one I ever heard. <laughs> How much longer are we going to wait, Ed? I'm not waiting any longer. We've got to get rid of Hannah. But, Julie, I... It's easy. All you do is do it. Do it quickly and it's done. Julie, I I can't. I, I can't divorce Hannah. I, I'd rather die. And, and she'd never Who's divorce... talking about that? You always pretend you don't know what I mean. You know well enough. Inside, your heart jumps like mine because you know we're going to do it. No. It's the only way. Ed, you'd be surprised how easy it is. Remember I, I once told you about that weakling from Carterville? That, that thing he used? No pain and no one would ever know. You get it in a drugstore. I can get it today and tonight at dinner you'll pretend some food spilled on your trousers. When Hannah turns, you'll... Well, I'll slip it into a cup of coffee. Well, Ed, will you or won't you? You'll be I... I'll do it. <laughs> Hot coffee, just like you like it, Ed. No, no, Julie, don't get up. <laughs> I swear the way that girl spoils me, Ed, doesn't let me do a thing. Why, she runs this house much better than I ever could. Oh, now, Mrs. Grimes, now you just sit down. <laughs> you see that, Ed? Draws up my chair, treats me like a queen. But I have revolted. I insisted that she at least let me make the coffee. <gasps> that reminds me... <laughs> Oh, the silliest rumor I heard today. What What was it? Oh, well, it, it isn't even fit to repeat. Uh, sit down, Julie, and drink your coffee. How is it, Ed? 
Fine, Hannah. Oh, Mr. Grimes. Yes? Weren't you supposed to do something for me? Mr. Grimes? What's that, Julie? Do what? Nothing. What is it, Ed? Why, Julie, whatever are you fixing with that purse of yours? Oh, oh. Goodness, what's wrong with you, Ed? Oh, I, I spilled some coffee on my trousers. Uh... Rub water on it quick or it'll stain. Oh, land's sake, Ed, it's a new suit. Couldn't you be a little more careful? Well, it, it, it's all right, Hannah. Just just a drop. It's delicious coffee. Mmm, it does smell good, if I do say so myself. Hannah, Hannah, don't, don't. Don't what? And then nothing. Nothing. Well, you are in the state tonight. Mmm. <laughs> Tastes good, too. Well, what about the movies after we get everything cleared away? Uh, there's a new picture down at the... Down at... at... <sighs> this coffee. Something is burning. <laughs> Help me, Joy. Help me, Ed. I... Uh, uh, uh. Ed, I, I thought you love me. Hannah, I do, Hannah. Forgive me. I, I was out of my mind. You'll be all right. I'll get a doctor. Get away from that phone. Put down that phone. Drop that phone, Ed, or I'll kill you. Hello. Hello. I've got a gun, Ed, if you don't drop that phone. Hello, uh, Dr. Meadows. Uh, don't let you. Don't you. believe me. You're going to put down that phone? No? You want a second bullet? Okay, then hear it. All right, lady, drop my gun. No, you don't. I'm not afraid of the police. You won't take my home away from me, not this time. Uh, my home. My beautiful Oh. What happened here, Mr. Grimes? You hurt bad? I'm all right, Officer Daly. Quick, my wife. She's been poisoned. We'll get her to the hospital right away. Oh, the girl here is dead. Hannah. Hannah? She's unconscious. We'll get her to the hospital. And then you'll come with me to headquarters. There are a few questions you'll have to answer. Questions? There's a statewide alarm out for this girl. We traced her to your home, and I was on my way over here to warn you. She was wanted in Carterville, Glen Springs, several places. Complicity in half a dozen homicides. Julia? A killer? All women are victims. Wives. Poison, just like in your wife's case. You gonna confess? Confess? Me? Uh, they usually do, the husbands. But you know, Mr. Grimes, I kind of feel sorry for that girl. She was plenty confused, but strangely enough, on only one subject. You see, she was brought up in an orphanage, and she never had a home of her own in all her life. Well, let's go, Mr. Grimes. At my trial, not one of all my friends came forward to speak a good word for me. No one but my wife, that is. She'd gotten well enough by then to be brought into the courtroom in a wheelchair. <laughs> Poor Hannah sure spoke up for me. But the jury pitied her too much to show me mercy. Anyhow, they thought her words very queer, I guess, especially when she said... He's a good man, Your Honor. It wasn't his fault, really. Not really. Sometimes, something that's not ourselves... I mean... Well, maybe it was my fault. I mean to say, after all, he was away, and I really shouldn't have answered that doorbell.
The Avenger. The road to crime ends in a trap that justice sets. Crime does not pay. Avenger's sworn enemy of evil is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected two inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger. The telepathic indicator, by which he is able to pick up thought flashes, and the secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now, The Avenger and Rendezvous with Murder. There's a train coming, Bates. We'd better hide over there behind the bushes until it goes past. Come on, nobody will notice this temper. It's nearly done. I'm not taking any chances. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're out of sight here. Yeah, well, who's going to see us out here on this lonely road? I'd like to know. A brakeman or the engineer, maybe. How many years do you have to spend in a pen before you learn not to take any chances on witnesses? Oh, lay off that tavern, will you? We're out now, ain't yeah, we? Yeah, but I'm not forgetting them five years, Bates. I know because you bungle a small time stick up. Why, we could have pulled this Glenhurst bang job long ago if we hadn't landed in the jug. Fly low so the train goes past. Yeah. Okay, it's gone. Let's get out of here, Tapper. This, this place gives me the creeps. Yeah. I just as soon forget what happened to this crossing myself. Mm. Say, is this the spot where we planted that contract on the track six years ago? Sure it is. Yeah, right down the road. There's a place where you and me jumped out of the car and sent it headlong into the 815. Yeah, that's right. Say, I recognize it now. Hey, what'd you come this way for, Tapper? I don't I don't like to think of that guy we bumped off. You know, murder's one rap you can't. Shut be- up. Nobody said it was murder, did they? The police said it was an accident, just like we planned. It was a pretty slick job all around. Well, maybe, but I still don't see why we had to park our car and come this way. I suppose you'd sooner go down Main Street so everybody could get a gander at us, huh? Oh. Right here. Hmm? Turn turn this way. Through these gates. Hey, Tapper, what's the idea? That's a graveyard. Sure. And there ain't a better place for two guys to lay low for a couple hours. Come on. Oh, I don't like this, Tapper. It's it's like... Well, like the coppers are always shooting off about. Returning to the scene of the crime. It's it's like we was trying to put a jinx on ourselves. Oh, damn that kind of gab. What's the matter, Bates? Are you turning yellow? No. Only I Come was Come on, just... then. We'll go over there under them trees and... Stretch out and have a smoke. Yeah. Well, how long we got to wait in this place? Well, it won't be safe to start working on the bank until close to midnight. I figure it shouldn't take us more than an hour to pull out that little section of wall, grab the swag, cover our tracks, and hit the road. Oh, yeah, yeah let's, let's sit down here. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, give me a light, will you, Vince? Yeah, here. Hey, hey, look, look at that, will you? What now? That, that tombstone. 
Look what it says. Put your flashlight on it and, and stop blubbering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hold it steady, will you? Okay. In memory of Peter Moultrie. It said contractor guy we bumped off. That was his name, Moultrie. P- Peter Moultrie. Hey, hey, yeah, that's him, all right. Well, I'm getting out of here. Stay where you are, Bates. This guy, Moultrie, has been dead and buried for almost six years. He can't hurt us. Yeah, but Tapper, I tell you, this place is a jinx. Let's pull out, huh? Hey, you nuts. Sit down. We've got some plans to make. Yeah, but this job's got the finger on it, Tapper. I, I can feel Shut it. Shut up and listen to me. There's a couple of hundred grand just waiting for us down there on the Glenhurst Bank. All we got to do is go in and take it. I know. Now, here's the blueprint of the bank I snitched when we was helping build the place. Yeah, hold hold that a little lower. All right. Uh, Okay. Now, here's the section of the back wall we rigged. Plenty of room to crawl through. Yeah, but what if somebody hears us knocking the wall out? Not a chance. We fixed that section so it's as weak as putty. Now, this muffled hammer will loosen the bricks. Well, are you sure about the alarm tap? Sure. Hey, remember how we looped the wires? Uh Uh-huh. That'll keep the alarm dead within the limits I've marked here. Now, how about the vault? You got all that dope straight, Bates? Yeah, yeah, I can open that all right. Now, we got to be careful about fingerprints. Don't forget, we've got a record now, and they'll nap us pronto if we leave any calling cards. Uh I got all that. Okay. Now, after we put the dough in the car, we go back and patch up that hole in the wall. That's the part I don't like. I don't see why you want to do that, Tapper. Because that'll give us a whole extra day to get away. That's why. Now, this is Saturday night. If nobody notices anything wrong with the wall, the stick-up won't be discovered until Monday morning. Yeah. I guess you're right at that. Now, now let's grab a couple hours rest. We'll need it when we start driving. Yeah? <laughs> sure. This is the best place in the world to sleep. <laughs> Sweet dreams, pal. <laughs> Hey, Tapper! Hey, Tapper! Take it easy, Bates. What, what's it? Oh, wait a minute. It's only a dog running down toward the freight yard. Oh. What time is it, Tapper? Uh, 10.30. It's time for us to start moving, huh? Bates, I've been thinking. There's just one thing that could trip us up on this job. What's that? It's a long shot, but it's the kind of long shot I don't like. Well, listen, Tapper... You can count me out if it ain't foolproof. I ain't gonna we do anything. We can make it foolproof, Bates. Uh, well, I, I don't get you. Well, when we was helping build that bank, we went under phony names and kept to ourselves. Yeah, we was careful, all right. You you wouldn't let me go no yeah, place. Yeah, but remember Moultrie's little girl coming around one day and taking pictures of all the men on the job? No, no, I don't remember that. Well, she did. Later, I got negatives from her, but now I'm wondering if she might have kept them pictures. Well, what if she did? What's the difference? Plenty. The minute this stick-up's discovered and they get a gander at that pulled-out wall, the coppers will know it was framed by somebody who helped build the place. <laughs> and then they'll start investigating all them guys, huh? Yeah. Yeah, but they'll be up a blind alley about us because of them phony names. Huh? And that's where the pictures figure in. That girl would turn them in and the police would match them up with two guys in the rogues' gallery by the name of Tapper and Bates. Oh, that sells it. Count me out. Nothing doing. You and me are going to pay a little visit to Miss Janice Moultrie. We've got to get them pictures. Oh, not me. You're not I... afraid to steal a few snapshots from a kid, are you? No, only... Well, look, Tapper, she she won't be a kid now. She'll, she'll be grown up. So what? Well, nothing, I guess. Well, when do we get started? In another ten minutes. Say, Tapper, what if that Moultrie girl gets in our way? Then it's just going to be too bad for her. Because I'm not going to let any dame stand between me and that money. We'll get them pictures, Bait. If we have to plant that girl right down there beside her old man. Jim, it was sweet of you to drive all the way down here to Glenhurst to take Janice and me to the charity rally. Pure selfishness on my part, Fern. I miss you when you go away for weekends. Oh, that's nice. For a while, it looked as though both Janice and I were going to be stood up. Why? I thought Bill Cummings was going along. He called Janice half an hour ago. He has to work. Oh. Something about drawing up a will for a sick client. Oh, that's too bad. I was looking forward to seeing Bill again. Well, maybe after the rally. No, I can't. Inspector White's going to call me at my hotel at 11.30. Mm-hmm. I'll have to be there to get his call. We'll have to leave the rally early then. Dinner will be ready in a few minutes. I bet you'll both starve. Oh, Fern is always starving, Janice. Tell me, did she have an appetite like that when she went to school? <laughs> always. But how she managed to keep slim on was what stymied the rest oh, of us. I see where I'm in for a ribbon. <laughs> Jim, I'm awfully glad you could come. 
I wanted to talk to you about Dad. Your father? Yes, Janice still isn't convinced that it was an accident, Jim. No, I'm not, Jim. Oh, I know it was a long time ago, and everyone seems to have forgotten all about it except me. Well, it's natural for you to feel like that, Janice, but the police investigated the case thoroughly at the time, and there was no hint of foul play. I know all that, Jim, but I knew my father. He was a most careful driver, and it was never established what he was doing out there on that lonely road that night. Well, I'll recheck all the evidence tomorrow, if it'll make you feel any better, Janice. Thanks, Jim. Oh, hello, Bosco, old boy. Come here, boy. <laughs> well, I believe old Bosco's glad to see me. Oh, Bosco, get down. No, no, it's all right, Janice. Come on, boy. Hiya, boy. Hiya, fella. We'd better go Come into on, dinner boy. now so we can get started for the rally. <laughs> Don't bother getting out of the car, Jim. You'd better drive straight to the hotel to get the inspector's call. Yeah, it's 11 o'clock now. After your call comes, Jim, why don't you pick up Bill at his office and both of you come back for a snack? Yes, do. Oh, that'll be fine. Now, let's see. Bill's office is on the second floor of the bank building, isn't it? That's right. We'll expect you in about an hour, then. Yeah, maybe less. So long. Bye, Jim. I wonder where Bosco is. He usually meets us at the gate. Oh, he's probably down at the freight yard. The men down there on the meat cars are always feeding him. Oh, they spoil him terribly. <laughs> now, where's my key? Oh, here it is. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Fern. I always dread coming into this house alone when Aunt Martha's away. What was that? Oh, Bosco must be here. Turn on the living room light, Fern. Bosco! Bosco, where are you? Stay right where you are, both of you. What do you want? What are you men doing in my house? We just dropped in to have a look at your picture album, Miss Moultrie. My picture album? Yeah, where is it? I won't tell you. No? Well, maybe this gun will make you change your mind. Now I remember you. I remember both of you. You worked for my father on the bank construction job six years ago. You've got a good memory, Miss Moultrie, and that's just too bad for you. Now, talk. Where's them pictures? I won't give them to you. Well, we'll see. Give her the arm treatment, Bates. I'll keep this other dame covered. All right, sister. Start singing and make it fast. We're in a hurry. Let me go. No. There you are. No, I won't tell. Oh, let her alone. Oh, help. Help. Shut up, you. Well, Miss Moultrie, are you going to talk, or does Bates have to break your arm? Oh, tell them, Janice. Don't let them hurt you like that. All right. Let go of my arm. I'll tell you. Be quick about it, then. The album's in a chest in that closet. Get it, Bates. Okay. I know what you're after now. You want those pictures I took of you. Smart girl. Too smart. Hey, you find it, Bates? Yeah, the album's here, all right. Well, hurry up. See if the pictures are in it. Yeah, well. Uh, here they are. Hey, they're good, too. Now, will you take them and get out of here? Uh, we'd be pretty dumb to do that, wouldn't we? No, you two dames are coming with us. Coming with you? Why? Security reasons. I've learned that the only good witness is a dead witness. You can't get away with a thing like this. You Thanks. know you... Go we'll bring the car up in front of the house. We're all going for a little ride.
now back to the Avenger and the rendezvous with murder. Why, this is the freight yard. Why you brought us here? We're going to let you off easy. We're sending you two dames off on a little trip. What are you talking about? You'll see. Uh, pull up here, Tepper. Yeah. Get out and open up one of them refrigerator cars, Bates. Sure. No. No, please, you're Come on, going to... this is the end of the line. Get out. Fern, what can we do? Nothing. Get out, I said. And one peep out of either of you, and it'll be your last. How you doing, Bates? Over here, Tapper. These cars are packed and ready to go. I got one of the doors open, though. Okay. Throw the dames in. Okay, come on, oh, Please, not Get in there. I'd rather be sure. Throw her inside, Bates. All yeah, right, Tapper. Now the other one. Come no. on, Bill. Come on, Bill. Yeah. Get in there. There we are. Now close the door and fix the lock. Quick. Okay. Yeah. That's that. Come on, Bates. Pounding, Janice. Maybe someone will hear us before the freight pulls out. I can't, Fern. My hands are getting numb. Oh, pound hard. It'll keep the circulation going. Oh, what's the use? We're doomed, Fern. We might as well face oh, it. Oh, Janice, don't give up, please. <laughs> it's Bosco. Oh, yes. Call to him, Janice. Bosco. Bosco, it's Janice. Get help, Bosco. What's oh, the This is Bill's office. Bill! It's Jim Brandon, Bill. Oh, must have gone, I guess. Well, that's strange. Bill wouldn't leave his office on the lot. Let's take a look. What's that hammering, I wonder? It's coming from below that back window. Ah, something very interesting going on down there. I wonder if Bill could have seen that. Better flash my light around here before I could... Bill! Somebody knocked him out cold. Well, it looks as though this is another job for the Avenger. Hold it a minute, Bates. Huh? What's up? Yeah. There's a copper pounding his beat on the other side of the street. That Flatfoot better keep moving if he knows what's good for Shut him. Shut up. Is he gone? Uh, yeah. He, he's just turning the corner now. Okay. We can get back to work. Right. Uh, I'm finished at this end. How about you, Bates? Well, just a little more. Okay. Did you check the wires, Tepper? Yeah. yeah. Just like we left them six years ago. Okay. I'm ready. Good. Uh, crawl in. The vault's right inside on the left. Yeah, yeah, I know. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. At least... Oh, boy, oh, boy, what a setup. Uh-huh. This plan was foolproof. There's the vault, Bates. Get busy. Hey, uh, give me some light here, will you? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta hand it to you, Tepper. This was a pretty sweet idea you dreamed up six years ago. <laughs> now you're willing to admit it was worth bumping off Moultrie for, huh? <laughs> <laughs> sure was. You know, that door is as good as ours right now. What was that? I heard a funny noise. Yeah, so did I, but... But there can't be anybody in here. Can't there, Tapper? Who's there? It's the Avenger, Tapper. I'm here to settle an old score for Peter Moultrie. Hey, somebody framed us, Tapper. Let's blow. No! He's one against the two of us. We can take care of him. Grab that crowbar, Bates. I'll flash the light around. We'll find him. Yeah. There's nobody here, Tepper. He's gone. No, I'm still here, Bates, but you can't see me. The boys came from that corner. Start swinging, Bates. Huh? Oh, oh, hey, somebody hit me. Keep swinging, you fool. We've got him cornered. Well, I think I hit something, Tepper. 
Hey, give me the light. Yeah. I don't see nothing. Well, that's mighty funny. I hit somebody, but there's nobody here. You're nuts. He got away. That's what. Yeah. Come on, Bates. We got to take it on the lamp. The cops will be here in a minute. They won't get far. As soon as I set off this burglar alarm, I'll start after them. Step on it, Chapper. I'm giving her all she got. This jalopy ain't got wings, you know. Hey, hey, look, Chapper. There's a car following her. Yeah? Hey, you're right. Hey, it must be that Avenger guy. I told you you didn't get him. I did. I hit him, but then he... Then he disappeared, I know. He scrammed. That's what he did. Hey, he's gaining on us. Give him a dose of lead, Bates. It's him or us now. Well, I'll try to hit his tires. Uh, did you get him? No, he's still coming. He's turned his headlights off. Try again. Hey, we're going too fast, Tapper. I can't get a bead on him. Hey. There's the railroad crossing up ahead, and the freight's coming. Yeah. If we can beat that freight to the crossing, we can lose this guy. It'll be close, but it's our only chance. Sit tight. What's the matter with the car, Tepper? I don't know. The engine. It sounds like that again. You can't make it, Tepper. Stop. We gotta make it. Hey, we're still on the night. Go, Tepper! Brakeman. Brakeman, over here. Bring your light. Well, if I ever saw anybody ask for what they got, those fellas did. Know who they were? Yeah, they just broke into the bank in Glenhurst. I saw them making that away and followed. Yeah? Well, they didn't get far. No, they certainly didn't. Say, that's Bosco. Come here, Bosco. Come here, boy. He's afraid all the way from the yard. Down. Down, Bosco, down. What's the matter, boy? What's it? Oh, he's out of scrap from that refrigerator car. I don't think so. I'm going to have a look. What is it, Bosco? What's the matter, boy? What are you trying to tell me? Somebody's in there. What's up? Somebody's inside that car, Brakeman. I heard a pounding on the door. I don't hear anything. Open up that car. I tell you, there's someone in there. Listen, bud, there can't be anybody in there. That's a sealed car. Sealed? Take a look at that door. That railroad seal's been broken. Yeah, you're right. Okay, mister, I'll open her up. Well, I'll be... It's Fern and Janice. Give me a hand, Brakeman. Sure. Jim. Yeah, there, it's all right, Fern. You're safe now. Here, quick. Help me get them out of here. They're almost frozen. Sure, you feel well enough to drive home today, Fern. Yes, I'm all right now, Jim. Of course, I don't feel in the mood for any winter sports yet. Have another hot drink, Fern. Thank you, Jan. There's just one more thing I'm not quite clear on, Jim. And what's that, Janice? Why did those criminals try to get rid of Bill? I think Bill can get you straight on that. What happened, Bill? Well, I was hard at work in my office when I heard a strange hammering sound below the back window. I looked out and saw two men down below. But when I called down to find what was going on, they 
He just disappeared around the side of the building. I decided to go down and investigate. But before I had time to get out of the office, the two men came in. One of them turned off the light and covered me with a flashlight. And the other one must have worked his way around behind me and hit me over the head. I see. Then when Jim came to call for you, he discovered what was going on. That's right. As soon as I saw what Tapper and Bates were up to, I went down and drained the gasoline out of their car. And then followed them into the bank. I wanted to get a line on them, so I listened to them talking for a while before I did anything. What did you find out, Jim? Well, they were boasting about how they'd planned the robbery six years ago. Evidently, Janice's father discovered what they were doing, so they killed him and made it look like an accident. Mm. But if you were in the bank with them, Jim, how did they make a getaway in their car? Well, that hole in the wall left the bank wide open. I had to sound the alarm before I followed them. Anyway, I knew they couldn't get far with a gas tank that was practically empty. It really seems as though those two men had a rendezvous with justice at that crossing, doesn't it? Yes, it was another so-called perfect crime that backfired. Well, now you just try to put it out of your mind now, Janice. Okay, Bill. Come on, I'll put a fresh dressing on your head. The doctor said to change every hour. Yes, nurse. Yes. We'll be back in a minute. Take your time. Jim, one doesn't have to be a detective to figure out that we'll be coming to Glenhurst for a wedding very soon. It certainly looks that way, Frank. Jim, do you suppose that we could... Could, uh, what, Fern? Do you suppose that we could... Could have picked up all this on a telepathic indicator if we had stayed at home? Characters, names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is a thought, a thought, a thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of... The Avenger... Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Basil Rathbone inviting you to join me beyond the green door. Today's story is about an ape, a poor caged beast far from his real home, which lay somewhere beyond the green door. Tyner should have expected trouble, but he was too wrapped up in his experiments on animal intelligence. The beasts he used were chimpanzees, monkeys, a baboon, and an ape. Tyler was so concerned about their intelligence that he forgot about their personalities, which was um, a serious mistake. His monkeys were cheerful and lively, the baboon had a gloomy dignity, and the chimpanzee was very nervous. But the ape clearly had a murderous disposition, which he tried to conceal under a short childishness. Tyner only saw his intelligence and his importance to the experiments. The first incident concerned a visitor who came too close to the ape's cage. A hairy black hand seized him and pulled him towards the bars. Tyner managed to break the grip with a chair. The visitor suffered a broken arm, but Tyner said that the ape really had meant no harm. And the ape's subsequent behavior seemed to prove that. He turned somersaults, searched for fleas, and acted like the tiniest monkey. He loved toys. If you gave him one, he would poke and probe at it. To obtain a better grip, the ape usually put the toy in his mouth, thus leaving both hands free. Who could suspect such a clever beast of homicidal urges? One afternoon, a month later, Tyner had fallen asleep on a couch. It was time to water the animals, but Tyner's wife didn't want to waken her exhausted husband, so she did the job herself. 
But she came too close to the ape's cage, and those terrible arms closed around her. And when her husband entered the lab, he found his pretty wife lying dead beside the ape's cage. She'd been strangled, and she wasn't pretty anymore. The ape was cheerfully playing in his cage. Tyler must have gone mad at that moment. He stood very still, watching the ape hold a toy in its mouth. Then Tyner hurried upstairs and came back with a revolver. But he didn't fire. He had conceived a more terrible revenge than that. Tyner fed the animals as though nothing had happened. Then he took out the toy box. Seeing this, the ape jumped up and down with excitement. Uh, Tyner gave him a toy to demonstrate his affection. Then, grinning amiably, he gave his revolver to the ape and stood back with insane cheerfulness to watch the beast put this new toy in its mouth and bring about its own destruction. The judge is still undecided about the case. There are only a few laws which govern the conduct between man and beast, and there is always the question of uh, extenuating circumstances. The judge must ask himself why Tyner had been so blind in the first place. But an even more important question is, why on that one day did the ape not put the gun in his mouth, but instead pointed it at Tyner and fired until the man was dead? Was it an accident? Or should we revise our ideas about the intelligence of animals? And finally, can other such incidents occur between man and beast? Are they happening now? We must find the answer, since a dog, for example, is every bit as clever as an ape. listener is aware all the time of an impending doom, a gradual build-up of terror towards a grand climax. Then again, there is the tale that seems gentle enough, a story of normal, happy people, recognizable scenes. And not until the very end, indeed not until the last minute or so, does it become apparent that something is very, very wrong. My play tonight falls into this latter category. We present Take Your Partners by Ronald Bly, the 45th consecutive production in Beyond Midnight. Biotex, the new soak and pre-wash powder presents Beyond Midnight by Michael McCabe. Just soak, just soak in biotech. Just soak, just soak in biotech. Just soak, just soak in biotech. If you have wondered how to get your washing really stain free, understand this. Biotech removes the stains and dirt washing won't. Just soak, just soak in biotech. Stains, grass stains, tiresome collar and cuff stains, ingrain dirt, soil and grime. Out they all come, and you don't stir a finger. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Biotex with natural enzymes is the pre-wash powder with the most enzymes to give you extra pre-wash power. Absolutely no rubbing, no color loss, no fabric wear. Use it for cottons, silks, woolens, synthetics. Use it to make new again. Soaking in Biotex removes the stains and dirt, but washing won't. Just soak. Just soak in biotex. Ah. Is that better? Ah. There's nothing in all the world like a log fire this time of the year. Nothing. Not coal, mind. Coal's not the same. Logs. Got to be logs. Ah. Messy stuff, coal. Twenty days to Christmas. Yes. It's funny, 
Christmas is never quite the same when you've grown up. Never the same excitement. You grow up, and you are allowed into a new, mysterious world. The world of adult people. But you pay for it. And the price you pay is the surrendering of all the privileges of the young. You lose the chance forever of looking into the mirror of childhood. I know what you mean. But there are compensations. You can stay up late, drink strong drink, go dancing, fall in love. <laughs> I suppose you dance. Dance? Hmm. A bit. Nothing spectacular. Mm. Mm. Now, what passes for dancing nowadays is simple enough, I suppose, as long as you've wind and energy for it. When I was young, though, uh, dancing was a serious thing, right enough. A serious thing. We all went to balls. That's what they called them. They're not dances. Summer and winter alike. Uh, you young people, you haven't a notion about those summer balls. The whole house would be turned upside down for a ball. All the windows were wide as we danced. The music sounded all night across the fields. We lived then. We danced for hours. No messy kerfuffle, and then off to a dark corner for hanky-panky. <laughs> the young ladies were stricter then. They thought more of themselves. Prouder they were. Now, oh, I don't know what the world's coming to. I don't know really. I remember one particularly. <laughs> Indeed, I'm hardly likely to forget it. Younger than you, I was. No more than 18, the laddie. The summer ball? No. This was at Campion's. They never gave summer balls. Your ignorance is abysmal. Campion's? I know. That's the old house by the river, where all the chestnut trees are, isn't it? Yes. That's Campion's. It's empty now. It was rented for a few months a couple of summers ago, but it's usually empty. Yes, it's empty now. Like all the big houses. Once... They were places of light and laughter, mystery and romance. Now, oh, what a garden. Chestnut trees, rustic gods, mossy pans and dianas, rose-covered arbors, green and golden ivy covering the walls of the great house. The swallows build their nests under the eaves in spring. On the river, lazy, meandering, and the punch tied under the willows, the green, green lawns, Campions. To Dolly and me, Campions was a haven, a kind of heaven. And now... Unless someone re-bricks the chimneys, they will fall down. But I suppose no one ever will. But I suppose they will fall down. The gardens are overgrown. The roses have gone wild. The great rooms of Campions are cold now. No more laughter. The Pans and the Dianas are still on their pedestals. But they've lost a hand here, a foot there. The weeds in the lawns. The grass is thick and rough. In flood time, the river came too high and spoilt the beds. Campion's is empty now. Still lovely in a sad, forgotten way. Regretful. <coughs> uh, another log on the fire, I, I think. Oh, let me, Grandfather. Where has my world gone? Were we all carried to another planet in 1914? The Earth is different. It's colder. The sun doesn't shine for so long in summer. Sometimes it seems as if the winters will never end. And you went to a dance, a, a, a ball there, at Campion's? Yes. It was the first ball I ever went to. There couldn't have been a better one to start with. You see, Campion's was the ball. You can imagine the excitement there was when Dolly and I got cards. Oh, it would be beautiful. Get 
Gerald, do you think Papa will take us in the carriage? Oh, Gerald, are you not so happy to be going? The guest list from Campions are always sent to the newspapers. Imagine, everyone will know. Dolly, you realize, of course, that now we've been invited to Campions, we're safe for the whole year. Tennis, the bishop's garden party, no end of other little beaners. Oh, really, Gerald? You're positively vulgar. I don't know what I will wear. Terribly worrying. Mama! And so we went. And our father did take us in the carriage. Not a very grand carriage, but a carriage all the same. And I remember your Aunt Dolly had a new dress which she'd started putting on after tea, although we weren't to be there before nine. <laughs> and did you enjoy yourself? Not at first, and certainly not afterwards. But between whiles was the strangest happiness I have ever known. arrived at Campions, I was so nervous that my gloves were miserably damp even before I'd had a single dance. My collar rose up and down my neck limply. Dolly began to dance at once with Mickey Tranter. Oh, you didn't know him, he's been gone for years. And I was left standing near the old ladies. The ball swept by like a sea. And every time Dolly passed by with Mickey, she stared at me crossly. She knew that I had one dance on my card, and that was with her. Honey, Auntie Gerald, you're so reckless. I will not be responsible for you. Do something. Done. Gerald, you are still standing there. The old lady wasn't cutting you, you know. You must do something. Oh, yes. The old ones were talking about me behind their hands. I felt them talking about me. I was so miserable, I wished I hadn't come. Worse, I knew that it would only be a matter of minutes before I was sent on endless errands for forgotten shawls and turkey sandwiches. So hardly realizing what I was about, I went off towards the garden room. And that's where it all began. The garden room, the night of the ball at Campion's. The room was empty, except for a girl with her back to me. <clears throat> <clears throat> she took no notice of me. She was staring out of the window. She was standing very really still. She did turn round, though, after a while. I had never seen anyone like her in the whole of my life before. I've never seen a woman like her since. Her beauty was a kind of everlasting radiance. She would have been revered in any land, in any age, as a goddess. Her hair was black, and it reached down to her waist. Her face was pale, and the enormous eyes just blinked once signifying that she acknowledged my presence. Oh, she seemed even shyer than I was. She didn't speak. She was wearing a gown that stretched in the fashion to the floor. It was gathered in a multitude of folds under her bosom. And the neck had the same startlingly pale quality as the face. The gown she wore was cut very low, and the extraordinarily handsome bosom rose and fell, scarcely noticeable as she stood, unspeaking, and faced me. My heart sounded like the gunfire that was in a few years later to echo across the world. I searched for words and found two, neither of them very original. Good evening. 
Like a new man. It's a lovely day today. I thought and I had a flu. I took a grandpa headache powder, and I'm well better. When colds and flu are about, grandpa headache powders are what you need. Grandpa headache powders work fast because they dissolve almost immediately. Grandpa makes all those dreadful flu symptoms disappear quickly. So, whenever you're in pain, get fast relief. Get grandpa headache powder. Ah, grandpa. Oh, darling, how do you look as though you're enjoying yourself? The party is great. Yes, it was until I ate. Well, take a dye gel. I always keep some in my bag. But I already took an antacid. Oh, yes, darling. But dye gel is much more than an antacid. Dye gel has double action. There's a layer of antacid plus a layer of semethicin. It's the semethicin that relieves that dreadful bloated feeling. Here, try a dye gel. Like they say. When you eat too well, demand Digel. You know, Ronald, there is an eternity between the man and the boy. No woman, except in kindness would wish to spend long away from a gay, music-filled room thronged with beautiful people, merely to stand in perfect repose, looking at the thin, pale creature that was myself at eighteen. But she did. The minutes passed. I managed to get my heart under control after a struggle. It's very beautiful here, isn't it? D do you come here often? To the Campions? What's your name? Christabel. The beauty of her voice was matched only by the loveliness of her appearance. Oh, I was in love with her at once, of course. The world could disappear, civilization pass away for all I cared at that moment in time. Indeed, time had ceased to exist. We were suspended in a bubble and had left the great house and its gardens. We were floating away, away, under the moon, amidst the stars. Have you been dancing tonight? No, I have not danced this evening. Perhaps, perhaps you, you, you are hungry. But, but perhaps, perhaps you'd like me to fe fetch you some refreshments? The, the cider cup is most excellent, I believe. No? You are... You... Yes? I, I, I was going to say... You are... Extraordinarily beautiful. Thank you, sir. I, I'm not, sir. I, I, I mean, my, my name is... Is Gerald. Gerald Beresford. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Beresford. Would would you um, would you would you care to, to sit for a while there by the window? That would be lovely, Mister Beresford. Oh, I beg you, call me Gerald. There was a scent about her, a scent like a garden at night. Gardenias or the deep red carnations, or oh, I don't know. It's difficult to remember. The years separate me from her, everything but the memory of her. Whatever it was, it was natural and heavenly, I do know that. Did you hear the nightingale, or, or was it the blackbird singing? The blackbird sings beautifully. Although the poets always use the nightingale's name in their verses. Perhaps it is a more romantic bird. Although the common blackbird... Sings as sweetly and yet... Receives none of the praise. No. 
Her hands were folded in her lap. They were without appendages, no ring, no bracelet encompassed her wrist. She was natural, perfectly so. There was not a scrap of makeup upon her face. She needed nothing like that. And suddenly, I was no longer afraid. The words tumbled from my lips. I felt ill at ease in the ballroom. I, I, I didn't wish to dance. Well, there was no one, no one to dance with. I, I, I mean, there, there are people, people there. Yes, girls, many. But oh, I'm, I'm glad I came here. So glad. I, <laughs> I, I, I thought I'd be alone. I, well, I, I wanted to be alone until I saw you, Christopher. But I don't. Want to be alone now? She appeared to be leaning towards me. I felt suddenly dizzy. I felt as if I was falling, falling, falling towards her. Her face seemed larger. All the beauty of her increased, and I fell towards her. Towards. Christ. And my hands found hers, and the gunfire hammered in my heart. My lips found hers once more. Our arms were around one another, tight, tight. She was talking to me, but I couldn't distinguish the words. My hands were in her hair, her long black hair, and it covered her face, and my face, and we were drowning in her hair. <laughs> And it was as if I was suddenly become part of her. There was no separate me anymore. We were one. Our breaths and our lips and our bodies mingled, were lost in one another. And again, I was falling, it seemed. And I remember smelling those close, earthy smells of wood and fern and long, undisturbed dust. I heard singing, but from whose lips I cannot imagine, if indeed it came from lips... And I was lost, lost forever. It's quiet. I love the quiet. I love you. She was so calm, serene. She scarcely seemed to breathe. We were sitting now, bolt upright, in the middle of the round wooden floor of the garden house, just like two carvings. Then she slowly rose, smiled, and held out her right hand to me. I would like to dance. At this, my heart stopped. I thought of the floor of the ballroom, and the darkly flushed males whirling their women in the intricate loops of the waltz. I was afraid. But I bowed to her and took her hand once more. And without another word, we left the garden house. And with Christabel on my arm, I made for the ball. My confidence deserted me when I found myself about to be born into that melee. But there was no escape from the treacherous wastes of chalky floors spreading out before me. Gerald. And suddenly, we were part of the dancing throng. We were on wings. Why, dancing? They say a good dancer is able to take the poorest around the floor. Anyone could dance with her. I, I wonder what the old ladies are saying now. Oh, not so close to the card tables. <laughs> oh, we must be dancing faster than anyone else on the floor. Oh, I bet you're all envious. Oh, there's Dolly. <laughs> Mickey Transfer, you can't dance. Not like this. Mm, people are looking at us. I wonder... Oops, oh, oh, oh. oh, sorry, Christopher. That turn wasn't quite so good, was it? Never mind. We danced on and on. And then I was aware that things had begun to change. The band still played, but the couples on the floor became fewer and fewer. It might have been from my glorious exertions that I felt a heaviness, a languor, 
and would have led my partner to the side. But as though suspecting my thoughts, she became as wonderfully animated as in that very first moment. And instead of retiring, we, we danced more gaily than ever. I say we danced gaily. That wasn't quite the word for it. There was a kind of urgency in our movements. I might go as far as to call it a desperation. And at last, we were the only couple on the floor. I thought it wise to stop now, and I led her to the side. She seemed reluctant, as if she were loath to put an end to our waltzing. I caught a vague glimpse of Dolly and Mickey. They looked perplexed. Suddenly, I felt terribly ill at ease. There was only the one place to go. The garden room. Away from all the people. And so, I walked out of the ballroom with long wooden steps. I entered the garden. I hoped everyone had noticed her beauty. I entered the garden room again. I felt again the wonder that I'd known there but a short while before. I realized, too, that my life would never be quite the same again. We stood near the window. She staring out into the night, and much as she had been when I first entered in what seemed to me then another year. We had not moved when Dolly found us. So there you are, Gerald. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, hello, Dolly. Look, I, I, I'd like to introduce... Do you uh, know what you've done? Pardon? You fool! You spoiler! Shh, Dolly, please. Look, I, I must ask Come you... Come on. We're going home. You have ruined everything. I tried again by an elaborate mime to indicate my late companion who stood partly obscured by the curtains. But even in the midst of such anxieties, Dolly's temper wasn't a thing to be easily forgotten, I can tell you. I felt some even stronger emotion. Dolly's wrath seemed less terrible. You see, without looking round, I knew we were alone. You're drunk. Drunk? I, drunk? I, I, I didn't have a sip, not, not even the cider cup. Look, look, tell me, tell me what I've done. Don't just stand there like, like, like a volcano. I'll tell you. And what's more, I'll tell Papa. You danced nearly a whole walk by yourself in front of the county. And if you weren't drunk, then you're mad. And the lady? Did you see her again? No. But then we weren't asked again. I saw her name again, though. Her name? Where? In the old Campion's graveyard. Where? Christabel Forsyth, her full name was. Christabel Forsyth. She died in 1899. The ball to which I went took place in the late autumn of 1910. She was 19 when she died. In the village later, I made inquiries about her. She was remembered. It was very tragic, apparently. She loved dancing. In those days, they held coming-out balls for the daughters of the gentry, usually when the young ladies were about 17 or 18. Christabel Forsyth, a cousin of the champion, she'd been very ill for two years, and so had missed her own coming out ball. And so it was arranged near Christmas, 1899, that she should share the big dance with another young lady. She had a relapse, and died three days before the great event. She had set her heart on attending. That's why it was so sad. But... We were never asked 
to the champions again. So I never went to another ball there. If you have wondered how to get your washing really stain-free, understand this. Biotex removes the stains and dirt washing won't. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Stains, grass stains, tiresome collar and cuff stains, ingrain dirt, soil and grime. Out they all come and you don't stir a finger. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Biotex with natural enzymes is the pre-wash powder with the most enzymes to give you extra pre-wash power. Absolutely no rubbing, no color loss, no fabric wear. Use it for cottons, silks, woolens, synthetics. Use it to make new again. Soaking in Biotex removes the stains and dirt, but washing won't. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Beyond Midnight is presented every Friday night at half past nine by Biotex, the new soak and pre-wash powder. Welcome to the Black Mass. Memories of childhood bring only fear and sadness. I know not where I was born, 
I remember only this castle, infinitely old and infinitely horrible, full of dark passages and dismal high-ceilinged chambers. The stones in the crumbling corridor seemed always hideously damp, and the smell everywhere coming up out of the deeper passages from the remains there. The generations of bones had led endlessly down into the earth. The light was a dim and uniform gray, throwing no shadows. Outside in the forest, there was no sunlight able to come through the trees. The branches thickly interwove overhead, cutting out all sight of anything above. Except there was one black tower of the castle that reached beyond the trees. It rose up inside into a dark and inaccessible height. There was no stairway. It could not be ascended save by an impossible climb up the sheer wall, stone by stone. I must have lived in this place all my childhood, but I cannot measure the time. Someone must have cared for my needs, yet I cannot recall any person except myself or anything else alive. I think that whoever nursed me must have been terribly aged, my first conception of a living person was of something distorted, shriveled, decaying. I remember there was such a corpse. I often went to it with a feeling of reverence and attachment. It was a woman, ancient, lying as she had died partly eaten around the throat and chest, the terrible gesture of horror in her sprawled position and opened mouth. I would sometimes roam the passage where she lay. I seemed to be drawn there. I wanted to kneel before it, to lie my head against it. Once once, I recall, I, I reached, I reached out to touch her, and, and she seemed to draw away in horror as if some instinct of recoil had penetrated to the very bones of the hideous thing. It fell off the ledge, breaking apart on the stones below. I dared not touch her again. Otherwise, to me, there was nothing grotesque in the bones and skeletons that populated my world. They were to me more natural than the colored pictures of living people I found in many of the ancient books that lined shelves and piled corners. From such books, I learned all that I know. No teacher urged or guided me. And I do not recall hearing any human voice in all those years, not even my own. Although I read of speech, I had never thought to try speaking aloud myself. I felt conscious of youth because I remembered so little. I'd wander outside by the moat filled with a thick and stagnant water. I imagined it to be the great seas I saw in the picture books. I even constructed a boat, a toy boat, with masts, and set it upon the water. But the slime held it. It couldn't sail. I watched it slip through the surface, sinking slowly, inch by inch, down, down till it disappeared. Across the moat, 
under the dark, mute trees. I would often lie and dream for hours about what I read in the books, and would longingly picture myself there in the sunny world beyond the forest. So long, and now nothing will separate us. Nothing. The pictures would fade. They were not real. Oh, I wanted to make them real. I'd, I'd try to escape the forest. I'd, I'd run. I'd, I'd run, but the. The farther I ran from the castle, the more dense became the shade. The thickness filled me with a terrible fear until I forgot my search and, and turned back. Back. So through endless twilights I dreamed and waited. For what? Only skulls looked up at me, their gaping jaws, their silence. In my madness, I'd, I'd crush them. Who, who put me here? Why, why? My longing for light grew so frantic I could rest no more. The tower, the tower that reached up into the dark absorbed me. I stood beneath it and raised my hands into the abyss. There must be a way. There must be. I stood flat against the stones, grasping them. Strange, I could hold on to the stones more easily than I thought. I, 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 I pulled myself up, stone by by stone, round the tower, and up. Oh, up. I stopped and, and, and looked above. There was no end to the darkness. Below, the dim light seemed to be fading. But I had no fear. Oh, no fear. Oh, no fear. Only great anticipation. Why hadn't I tried before? There, there were ledges in the rock and places to hold. Places to hold. Hours later, I had reached the top. I clung to the stone my head against a roof, a stone panel that would lift. Oh, the climb had strengthened, not weakened me. Oh, it took a mere effort now to brace my shoulders against it and push up and out from the wall. The effort, the strain was pure joy. It felt as if something else was working, some other thing in me that drew me out. I was up. Stone had fallen shut, but I had reached the outside. And overhead was the radiant full moon, 
I had never seen it before except in dreams and in vague visions. Memory. Ah, sweet light. Fell upon me like... But where was I? How high above the trees? It seemed I was on a stone platform, but vast, vast, an observatory. But there were columns about, broken, and beyond the platform other stones, small ones with inscriptions and dates. Between the stones, ah, earth, earth, there stretched around me nothing less than the solid earth, housed with marble slabs and columns, and overshadowed by an ancient stone church whose ruined spires gleamed spectrally in the moonlight. The earth... <laughs> the earth... <laughs> Was this insanity? Or dreaming? Dreaming? There was a familiarity. Oh, but no, this was the world! And I would go forth to meet it. There were meadows with the smell of grass and trees that did not cover the sky. Oh, and houses, houses. Some ancient ruins that my mind tried to reconstruct, but others, others with lights. Ah, I could see figures inside. Lights. My mind played tricks. If I looked too long, the lights would fade. The figures melt away. The walls seem ancient, ruined. As if my own castle back there... No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I walked on. I, I almost knew the road. On. In a direction. Yes. Inevitably, in a direction. A large lit house, surrounded by a park with great windows, ablaze with light and sound. There was a courtyard. Oh. oh, this was the world. Oh, how brilliant it was. How merry. I had never heard human voices before. Yet it was familiar, familiar. Some of the faces seemed to hold expressions that, that brought up remote recollections. Oh, they, they smiled, they talked to each other, they laughed, laughed. Oh, world, the, the windows before me were, were two doors. I put my hands to each to enter and, and pushed open into the joyous room. And the people became silent. They all stared with a strange and, and familiar expression. I, I, I tried to speak to them, uh, but it, it was hard to speak. Uh, no! I, I walked toward them, but they fled, fled, every face distorted, screams, hands covering their eyes. Stumbling, stumbling away. Wait, wait, wait. L like, like mist, they faded before me. 
They seem to melt into the walls, through doors, dragging each other. No, wait! 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 Wait. They had all been gathered before a wall, which now stood there. with gilded designs bordering an archway. But the arch was glass, reflecting the room. There was only one figure in it, vague as I approached. Then more and more clearly I could see it. <gasps> it! A compound of all that is unclean, unwelcome, abnormal and detestable. The ghoulish shade of decay, antiquity and dissolution. A dripping, putrid eidolon of some unwholesome revelation. The awful bearing of that which the merciful earth should always hide. It was not or no longer of this world. Yet in its eaten away bony outlines I saw a leering abhorrent travesty on the human shape. Mine, no, no, no! The eyes as I approached held mine open. I couldn't turn away. But I would wipe out the sight. I'd reach out. Uh, I stretched out my fingers to the abomination. To touch a cold and unyielding surface of polished glass. But it would yield. It would yield. It would yield. Ah! At that last moment, I had recognized him. When I returned to the graveyard, the stone door was immovable. Now, now I ride with the mocking and friendly ghouls on the night wind and play by day in the catacombs. I know that light is not for me save that of the moon. Yet in my new wildness and freedom I welcome the bitterness of alienage. For I know always that I am an outsider. An outsider. Stranger in this century. For a time. A stranger among those who are still men. And now, good night.
Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box. The body lay like a squashed melon at the foot of the cliff. Period. Uh, period is right. Well, what happens now, Holiday? The inspector wonders how. The inspector wonders. Oh, no, it's Holiday who wonders. I wonder how. I wonder why. I wonder what... I wonder where you've been, Susie. But, Mr. Holiday, I've only been gone ten minutes. Went down to Star Times after the mail. Oh. Oh, so you did. What's new in Box 13? Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. <laughs> Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, this is quite a letter. Your ad, Adventure Wanted, will go any place, do anything, reads like a challenge. If it is, I dare you to go to Bay City Pier tonight and do what you will be told when you board the Ruthie J. The Ruthie J. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's the matter, Susie? You wouldn't go on a boat, would you? Well, why not? As a kid, I was a sea scout. Haven't been on a boat since, and I love them. But, Mr. Holliday, what if when you got on that boat, you were shanghaied? Susie, the word is shanghai Oh, shanghai shanghaied. What's the diff? Suppose some smuggler hits you over the head with a, a sloop or something, and, and... A sloop? Oh, Susie... Yes, a sloop. Uh, and then they sail off and dump you on the beach at Timbuktu. They couldn't sail off and dump me on the beach at Timbuktu. Why not? Timbuktu happens to be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Oh. Yes, oh. And please tie an anchor to that imagination of yours. Okay, Mr. Holliday. But if you wind up on the other side of the world, please don't write me a letter about your voyage. No? No. Just reading about the ocean makes me seasick. <laughs> Well, Holiday, this is it. Take in a lung full of that fresh ocean breeze. Mmm. Smell that fresh salt air. And fish. Mmm. Not so fresh. Well, the letter said I was to board the Ruthie J. I wonder where she'll be. I wonder what she'll be. A schooner, trim and neat, 42-footer, 12-foot beam. Uh-oh, there's your dreamboat. And brother, what a scow. Neat. Mm. Like a tub of dirty clothes in a mud puddle. Ahoy! Ahoy, mate! Hey, you over there. You calling me, Mac? Yeah. What's with this, uh, ahoy mate stuff? You're a seafaring man, aren't you? <laughs> Don't let these tight pants fool you. And just cause I'm standing on this sea jitney. Don't make me no sailor boy. Oh, my mistake. Where's the skipper? The skipper? Hey, look, Mac, I told you I ain't no sailor. With me, you gotta talk English. Right, Gunzel. Dip that heater back under your wing and take me to the boss of this fish factory now. Ah, that's better. Now you're talking my language. Can I help you across the rail? Oh, thanks. Say, uh, is your name, uh, Holiday? Yeah, yeah. Dan Holiday? Now, how'd you guess? Pleased to meet you. <laughs> Sweet dreams, Holiday. I hope you enjoy the boat ride. Holiday. Oh, Holiday, you've been sleeping long enough. Better wake up and see what's making your bed roll around like this. Oh, my ache. Hey, 
what is this? Don't look now, Holiday, but Susie was right. You've been shanghoed. You're out at sea. Well, and a pretty girl aboard. Hello, Mr. Holiday. I see you're up and around. Yeah, I'm up and my head's going around. <laughs> Bit of a blow, eh, Mr. Holliday? Uh, you mean the one on my skull or the one outside? Oh, I'm sorry about that sapping you took. Sometimes Manny leans a little heavy with that blackjack of his. Hmm. If he'd have leaned any heavier, he'd have driven me right through the deck. Uh, was it you who answered my ad for adventure? Does that surprise you? I uh, wouldn't have associated such a violent reception with a lady. You've embarked upon a real adventure. Uh, well, suppose I decide to sit this one out. You could go ashore. Mm -hmm. Now, which direction is ashore? Immediately astern. Oh, thanks. About 15 miles. Oh, well, in that case, I think I'll stay. Good. I didn't want you to decline my invitation, uh, which explains Manny and his blackjack as a reception committee. Oh? Well, since you're in back of this, uh, just who are you? My name is Marie Gordon. I felt you might be in need of a vacation, Mr. Holiday. Oh, sort of a holiday for holiday. Is that it? Exactly. Well, great. Now, just where do we go on this uh, vacation? You go fishing with the captain. Oh, I go fishing with the captain. What about you, Miss Gordon? I remain locked in my cabin. I have things to think about. What about Manny and his convincer? He didn't sail... Other business kept him ashore. Mm. The uh, plot thickens. I fish with the captain while you stay locked in your cabin and Manny with his blackjack prowls ashore. Correct. And uh, speaking of plots, Mr. Holliday, I've always admired those in your books. Uh, perhaps you could confirm something for me. Mm, I could try. Establish the case of someone having something not his own, wishing to keep it from another person who desires it as well. Where would you put it? Well, in the place you'd least expect to find it, of course. Of course, Mr. Holliday. Good night. Uh, good night, Miss Gordon. Remember, the fish bite early. I know, especially the suckers. There's a strong odor aboard this ship, and it isn't just fish. But there's nothing you can do tonight, Holliday, so you might as well get some sleep. Sailor's life is the very best life, so it's a sailor's life for me. A sailor's oh, morning. life for. You're the captain? Yep. Morning, sir. Come through last night, squall okay? Uh, yeah, except for this bump on my noggin. The only get his tension, eh? Twelve bit rough. Rough is right. Oh, um, I understand you and I are going to do some fishing. Aye, sir. These grounds is good for swordfish. Might even catch us a marlin. Uh, just where are we, Captain? Them islands way off there is the Catalinas. Plenty of albacore here, too. Doesn't Miss Gordon like to fish? Don't know, sir. This is the first time she's hired me in the Ruthie J. Then this isn't Miss Gordon's boat. Nope. She's mine. We're just chartered for this trip. How long are we provisioned for? Four or five days. Could put in at Avalon if you want to stay out longer. I didn't want to stay out this long. Not ready to go ashore so soon, are you, Mr. Holliday? A few days fishing is just what you need. What I need is to have my head examined. That bump still bothering you? No, but what might be happening back in town is... Relax, Mr. Holliday. Everything will be taken care of. Yeah? Yeah. But I'm wondering how and what and why. Why is right. Just why would a girl like Marie Gordon maroon you on a fishing boat? What's the gag? And how's it going to be pulled and on whom? Holiday is an author, you're not even a good fisherman. You're quite a fisherman, Mr. Holiday. Why, in just four days, you handle that heavy gear like a real deep sea man. Thanks. But don't you think we've got enough fish? You've got another. There goes your line off the outrigging. It's a big one. Let him run, sir. Now, hit him hard. Good. You've got him, sir. Don't look now, but but I think he's got me. He's a marlin, I think. Let him play. 
Well, let him go play with someone else. I'm tired. Oh, that's, that's too bad, Mr. Holiday. You set your drag too soon. That's why he broke the gear. I wanted to break the gear. I'm sick of fishing. Captain, I want to be put ashore now. Sorry, sir. Miss Gordon will have to give me new orders. Now, look, Captain, I'm going ashore. I'm going to be there before tonight. But, but Mr. Holiday... Captain, I... you heard the gentleman. He's going ashore. Aye, ma'am. Do we run for the mainland or the islands? Neither. We stay here. But you said Mr. Holiday was to go ashore. That's correct. Lower the dinghy, Captain. The dinghy? And hand Mr. Holiday the oars. The oars? Ma'am, we're more than ten miles off Catalina. If Mr. Holiday wishes to be ashore before tonight, he'd better start rowing now. <laughs> Oh, you beautiful Box 13. If it hadn't have been for you, I wouldn't be out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a rowboat. You better rest on your oars a minute, Holiday. Because the wind is coming up, the bump on your head is swelling, the ache in your back is growing, and the blisters on your hands are spreading. Oh, when Susie mentioned the beach at Timbuktu, she knew what she was talking about. There's no ocean there. Hey, uh, Spaulding. You're looking for me? Oh, oh, there you are, Manny. Yes, yes, I've been looking for you. Now, what does the great Edward B. Spaulding want with me? Quiet. Quiet, will you? You should know better than to mention me by name. Get in that booth. Ah. <laughs> None of your penthouse-type clientele would be in a joint like this. Have a seat, Spaulding. I tell you, that doesn't matter. I, I just shouldn't be seen even talking. In that case, hit the road. I gotta keep my rep, too. Meaning what? I'm a nice, honest hood. And even though you act and look like the owner of Tiffany's, to me, you're just a fence. Where's your boss, Marie? She's out fishing. Fishing? She couldn't be. Look, pretty boy. If her and this holiday want to do an efficient trip... It's their business, see? It's my business to get what I've paid for. The last shipment's overdue. Now, where is it? <laughs> You're Sander. Kind of tough. For you. With the amount of money this deal involves, I can get tougher. Well, I don't know from nothing. You gotta talk to her. If Marie's trying to pull something... Hey, wait a minute. You mentioned a holiday. That wouldn't be Dan Holiday. Did I say, uh, Holiday? Thought I said, uh... Hollahan. <laughs> or was it Halloween? All right, Manny, be a comedian. But tell your boss if she doesn't produce that merchandise by tomorrow, there'll be trouble. Ha, ha. <laughs> if I told her, she might die of fright. If she doesn't come through, somebody is going to die. And it won't be from fright. Well, Holiday, you finally made it. You were towed into Catalina, hocked your watch for a ticket, and flew right back to town. If this is adventure, you'd better stick with the more dangerous sports like croquet or something. Susie. Oh, I forgot about Susie. She'll wonder what's happened. I'm four days late for lunch. She's not here. I guess she got hungry. She's not here, Holiday, but I am. Yeah, who are you? Get in that office. All right. All right. All right, now what's this all about? I want to know where you've been for four days. I uh, don't think I've had the pleasure. It may not prove to be a pleasure, if what I suspect is true. Now, where's Marie Gordon? Marie Gordon? From your expression of surprise, I gather you know what I'm talking about. Did you catch any fish, or was it larger game you were after? Not knowing who you are. I'm at a disadvantage. Disadvantage is even greater now. Now do you talk or do I shoot? Oh, do I have a choice? No. In that case, I'll talk. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to 
Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Holliday, you can run into more trouble than a kid playing football with a beehive. You know, I don't think this guy's in the mood to believe you just got bopped on the bean and taken for a boat ride. He thinks you're in on the deal. Yeah, but what's the deal? Come on, Holiday, talk. Oh, I'd love to, but what do we talk about? About five minutes. And if by then you haven't told me where you and Marie have been instead of fishing, I'm going to pull this trigger. Now, believe me. I caught five tuna, ten albacore, four swordfish, and a pair of blistered hands. And that's no fish story. Hey, where are you going? Over here to turn up your radio. You see, I'm very considerate of others. This is a very big gun. Makes a very big noise. I don't want to disturb the neighbors when it goes off. Okay, mister, whatever your name is. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. And if you don't believe me, you can start shooting. You sound very brave, Holiday. And I act very dumb. Now, I know it was stupid of me to accept a blind invitation to visit a boat named the Ruthie J. Because when I got there, a tough character in tight pants used my head for a dinner gong. Somebody slugged you? Yeah. And I've got the bump to prove it. This character's name wouldn't begin with the letter M. As far as I'm concerned, it ended with A-N-N-Y. So it was Manny. Now, well, go on. Well, while I was unconscious, I was tucked Betty by in the cabin of the boat. And when I woke up, I was gazing into the lovely blue eyes of one Miss Marie Gordon, a woman I have never seen before in my life. Then I suppose you and this total stranger went fishing for four days. Now you took the words right out of my mouth. Well, find some more. And tell me you didn't ask any questions. That you were just brought back home with salt spray in your hair, a beautiful tan, and nothing else. I asked plenty of questions. To which I got plenty of no answers. And for your information, I wasn't brought back home. Oh? You, uh, swam? No, I rode. Ten miles, all the way to Catalina. There I caught a plane, took a cab from the airport, and found you here waiting for me. That, brother, is my story. You, uh... Turn off the radio. What's the trouble? No gunplay? No gunplay. Uh, Great, but why the change of heart? Holiday, I understand you're quite an author. But even you couldn't make up a story like that one. So, Holiday, you got rid of the mysterious man with a gun. Hey, but what about Susie? She's not here. She's not at home. The start time's... They'll know what happened to her. Well, if it isn't Dan Holiday, have a nice vacation. Oh, wonderful, Jonesy. Hey, have you seen Susie? Not since the other morning. She came in with a wire telling her to take a few days' vacation. Hey, who told her to take a vacation? Well, you did, of course. Don't you remember? Jonesy, sometimes my left hand just doesn't know what my right hand is writing. Where'd she go? She didn't say. She came in with a man wearing tight pants. She looked for the mail. There wasn't any, and they went away. Man with the tight pants. Manny, I'll see you later. Now, now, wait. All this mail came while you've been gone. And a box, too. Here. A box? Hmm, what could this be? Maybe candy. Oh, nobody loves me that much. Wait. What? You hear something tick in that box right now? T- tick? You think it's... I think you better get that thing out of here. Oh, but Jones, yeah, I... Take the police headquarters. Get it out of the building fast. It might blow up any minute. <laughs> You've ridden in many a taxi cab holiday, but this is the first one you've taken with a maniac in the driver's seat and a bomb in the back. Inspector Blake, that's my man. You say this thing ticked? Yeah, it sounds like a clock in there. Oh, come on, hurry. Where are we going? We've got a bomb shelter down in the basement. Oh, that's great, but why take the bomb with us? We're going to open that box. That's all I need. Been soaking for 30 minutes. We're safe now. Whew. Thanks, Inspector. Say, do you mind shoving my heart back into place for me? Now, there's nothing to worry about, my boy. We'll open up this beauty and see what we've got. Holy smoke. These are jewels, Holiday. Now, what made you think this was a time bomb? 
I have an aversion to anything that ticks. And I have an aversion, too. To people like you who come in here talking about time bombs when all they've heard are some loose jewels clicking together. Well, I'm sorry, Inspector. Well, uh, I think I'll beat it. Just, just let me wrap up those stones. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Those jewels stay here until you can prove ownership. Now, where'd you get them? To whom do they belong? Give me about 30 minutes, Inspector, and I think I'll be able to answer you. So that's what it was, Holiday. A stunt to smuggle jewels. In the box 13, no less. That Marie Gordon, she's a clever, clever girl. No wonder the mysterious character at the office was waving that gun at me. Oh, think of what would have happened if I'd tried to lie to him. Come on, Holiday, you've got places to go and some people to meet. I was sure worried about you rowing all that way, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that's okay, Captain. Hey, uh, what I came here for was to locate Miss uh, Gordon. Do you know where I can find her? She's a popular woman. Two other men come looking for her. Two men? Yep. One was a smooth-looking sort of fella... The other was a tough. With tight pants? That you mention it? Yes. He was here when we docked. Uh, what happened? Did you hear the conversation? Only that the tough one was to go right quick to a place called Rambler's Inn and wait. Uh, then the other man arrived? Yep. He seemed sore about something. They got in a car together and drove off. That's the last I see them. Captain, you're terrific. When my blistered hands heal up, you and I are going back after the mile and it got away. <laughs> All right, Matt. Where do you think you're drawn? Well, well, if it ain't Mr. Holiday again. Only this time, I don't think you were invited. Yeah, that's right. And this time, you're the one who's going Betty by. You fool. Pleasant dreams, Manny. Here. Just in case you get restless in your sleep, let me tie in bed with this bailing wire. I didn't have time to ask you in which cabin there were, Manny. With those angry voices I hear down the line, I don't think they would be coming from honeymooners. Free for the last time, where are those jewels? Don't threaten me, Spaulding. Manny's right outside. One call from me and he'd be all over you like a rug. I gave you the money to pay off the smugglers. I want the jewels. At first, the boys didn't want to turn over the stuff. When they finally did, I thought they might try to get it back. So you went off on a fishing trip with a man named Holiday. Why? Certainly. And for a good reason. Holiday has the jewelry. What? How did he get into this? You know about his ad in the Star Times? What about it? Well, I thought we might have trouble with the boys. I had to think of a place to put it where they wouldn't expect to find it. So? I sent it to Box 13. <laughs> Where are you going? To pay another visit to Dan Holiday. Don't bother. What? I'm here. Holiday. Manny. Manny. I'm afraid Manny won't hear you. What? He's taking his nap. And you look sleepy too. Wait. Say, Manny's blackjack works fine. Your friend Spaulding is sleeping like an infant. Now. Now. What? Now, what's this about my having that smuggled jewelry? You, uh, could share in it with me. You're very generous. I can afford to be. Duty-free and with Spaulding's wealthy clients. Oh. You decided to cut Spaulding in after all. Why should I? What do you mean? I'd rather cut you in, Mr. Holliday. No, thanks. I'm not interested. But that's foolish. Think of all that money. I am, but I'm also thinking of a great tag for the yarn I'm going to write. But what will that get you? Royalties, lady. Royalties. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Holiday, prepare 
prepare yourself for an I told you so from Susie when she comes in. <laughs> Brother, wait till she finds out she was right about those smugglers with my Bing Shang Ho. Holiday. Uh, what is it, Inspector? Uh, we've been after that smuggling gang for a long time. If that Gordon dame hadn't gotten so greedy and tried to chisel on Spaulding, we wouldn't have caught up with him so soon. And, of course, uh, you helped a bit, too. Uh, coming from a police inspector, those are very kind words. Well, Susie, it's about time you showed up. Oh, hello, Mr. Holliday. My, what a beautiful tan. Catch any fish? All kinds. Tell me, Susie, where have you been? Out of town. The wire you sent me said to take a vacation for five or six days. Oh, the wire I sent, which I didn't send. Well, anyway, you didn't specify which, so, Mr. Holliday, I took six. I see. And Mr. Holliday... Yes, Susie? Y you know the nice man that I went down to Box 13 with? Yes. Well, I told him how I warned you about t being taken by smugglers, and do you know what he said? No. What did he say? He said you were right about the smugglers. They wouldn't hit you on the head with a sloop. They'd use a blackjack. Oh, fine. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger with original story by Frank Hart Tausig. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. I'm so glad you came by. Today, we return to the small, peaceful town of Biloxi. It seems that there was this old abandoned house on the corner of Main Street. Well, there was some talk of this house being haunted, mostly children with overactive imagination. However, on this particular Wednesday afternoon, a very distinct moaning sound emitted from the derelict structure. Well, the citizens who live nearby in this old house were quite unnerved by the sound. And the Biloxi Police Department was flooded with calls that day. <laughs> Hello. Pluckett Police Department. Self Michael speaking. Oh, oh, howdy, Miss Pluckett. What can I do you for? Oh, well, you say you hear strange noises coming from the old Fortin house? We got us another one, Chester. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, now, Miss Pluckett, it, it's probably just a couple of alley cats in the heat. Yes, ma'am. I, I know it sounds horrible, but they get that, that way when they, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, now, if they don't stop in the next 30 minutes, I'll send a deputy down to go check it out, all right? 
Okay. You do the same. Thank you kindly, ma'am. You want me to go down to that house and check it out, sir? Shoot, no. Ain't worth the gas go down there. <laughs> Take the phone off the hook and hand me a donut. All right, sir. Well, as the noise from the house persisted, and it sounded nothing like a cat, it was quite unmistakably human. It was about midnight when Mr. Elmer Corn, a well-known resident of Biloxi, was awakened from sleep. Oh, huh? oh where's the fire? Huh. There, there you go. Damn, it's five minutes to midnight. Who in the world could that be at this ungodly hour? Huh? All right, all right. Don't worry out the door, Bill. I'm coming. Oh, Elba, uh, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, well, uh, howdy, Miss Maddox. Uh, did you come to bury some toilet paper? No, no, I didn't, Elba. But I can really use your help, though. Well, uh, anything at all, Miss Maddox. Uh, come on in. Oh, oh thank you, Elba. Gee, it must be important for you to be up this late. Elmer, I'm just at the end of my rope, yes. and all my neighbors are, too. You know that old house on the corner of Main Street? Uh, the old Thornton house? Uh, yeah, that's it, Elmer. Well, there, there's awful, horrible, terrible noises coming up from that house. Oh. Well, it could be a couple of old cats. It ain't no cat, Elmer. It's human, sure as I am alive. Mm. Human. Just like a man in pain. Well, did you uh, try calling the police? Oh, those police are just busy stuffing donuts into their big, fat faces. I know what you mean. Elmer, would you go down to that house and, and check it out for me, would you? Well, well, Miss Maddox, I, you see, I got a manure haul at six in the morning. But Elmer, and I need my sleep. It, it, could, could I do it tomorrow afternoon? Elmer, this just can't wait. I live just two blocks down from that house, and you just got to see what well, it is now. Well, well uh, all right, Miss Maddox, okay. I'll go call up Cecil Ferris. He's got one of them high beam uh, flashlights, and we'll go down there and check it out for you. Oh, oh, thank you very much, Elmer. I just couldn't get awake to sleep with all of that noise going on. This old house is a musty place. I ought to have my head examined for letting you drag me in here, Elmer. Well, I ought to have my head examined for asking you. I should have known you'd start bellygaking about it. Wake me up at a quarter past midnight to come prowl around in some haunted house? Well, well, you got the big high beam flashlight. That ain't the reason, Elmer. You just didn't want to come in here by yourself. Oh, oh, hesh up, Cecil, and hold that light steady. All right. Head and gum. Ain't nothing in this old house but a bunch of cobwebs. It's all that talk of this place being haunted that's got everyone so worked up. It is haunted. Charlie Thornton killed his wife in this house. <sighs> then he turned the gun on himself. Well, Charlie Thornton wasn't all there, Cecil. Heck, the man used to talk to his shadow, you know that. Yeah. Besides, it's all in the past now. Well, Bernie Edwards said he saw the ghost of Mr. Thornton in the window up there. Yeah, well, Bernie sees a lot of things after a six-pack or two. Well, I don't see nothing in here. Well, let's go check the kitchen and then we'll... What the heck was that? It's it's the ghost of Charlie Thornton, Elmer. It ain't no such thing, Cecil. It sounded like it come from the fireplace. Yeah. You're shining your light over there. Uh, all right, all right. Oh, take the light away. Leave me in my misery. Leave me in the darkness. Dad, gum it, Elmer. Looks like somebody covered in an old sheet. Yeah. Uh, uh w w what's the matter, mister? You in some sort of pain? The pain, the eternal pain. I can endure it no more. The burden is too great. Relieve me of my task, O oh spirit of another world. Set me free from my never-ending destiny. Let's let's leave this feller alone, Elmer. You just stand there with that light and hash up, Cecil. Uh, uh, come here just a second, Mister. We ain't gonna hurt you, I promise. You from out of state? Maybe some relation to the late Mr. Thornton? Uh, no. I am... dead. Dang, go. Uh, could you run that past me just one more time, mister? I am the Reaper. 
You mean, uh, you mean the Grim Reaper? I never liked the Grim, Paul. But, but it is Grim, isn't it? Dad, gum it, there's nothing underneath that sheet. There's no face, there's no hands, nothing. Oh, settle down, Cecil. He, he's probably just a uh, dark complexion. No, your friend speaks the truth. I have no form or shape. I am like a foul wind. The cloth gives the illusion of shape. I thought if I took the shape and voice of a living man and took shelter in this dwelling, I could escape the spirits of the netherworld, but they'll find me. I am cursed for eternity. Oh, you, you mean to say when a feller dies, they meet up with you? Yes. I show them the way to the beyond. Dang it, this is too much for me. Hesh, Cecil. Well, sir, you, uh, you show people to the hereafter. Uh, that don't sound like such a bad job. Not bad. Not bad. Perhaps not for those who have lived a long and fruitful life. But what of the young? Those whose lives have been extinguished by hunger or disease... I must take them away before they have had a chance to live. Oh. The burden is too great. Well, well, you poor fella. A and you say these spirits of the netherworld gave you this job? I was created in the netherworld by the spirits of that region. I wish to be free of this horrible task. Well, sir, I, I think everybody needs a vacation from their job now and then. What in the world are you saying, Elmer? Well, I mean... Hey, this man plumb tuckered out. Mm. And shoot, I mean, mm. it must be a high-pressure job, you know. Mm. I mean, can you imagine how many people die every day? Oh, it is an extraordinary amount, I assure you. Well, I'd imagine so. So why don't you just go incognito for a couple of days? Uh, Could be all you need is a little break to collect your thoughts. Well, uh, I, uh, I don't know. Well, sir, I know. You just won't be dead for a couple of days, all right? You say these spirits of the netherworld are looking for you? Well, it's liable to be a couple of days before they find you. And until that time, you'll just be a regular fella. Mr. D, how's that? Uh, Mr. D? Yes, sir, Mr. D. I'll tell you what you do. Now, me and Cecil are about to go over to Miss Maddox's house. She's this sweet old widow woman that lives down the street from us. And we'll go up to her and we'll say, Hello, Miss Maddox, this here's Mr. D. He's a stranger in town, gonna stay a couple of days. And you know what she'll do? She'll whip you up the finest, biggest meal you ever ate in your life. <laughs> Sweet potato pie, dumplings, chicken. Mm. You'll stuff yourself till you can't breathe. But, uh, but I do not eat. Well, you talk, don't you? Miss Maddox will talk a year off. Some good conversation, that's what you need. So why don't you do that? Next morning... Tomorrow, 7.30, me, you, and Cecil go over to Miss Maddox's house, and we'll just have us a good old time. What do you think? Well, I... I suppose I could do that. Well, I just flat dab insist, sir. Until then, you come over to my house, and you're going to stay the night there, and I don't want no argument. Yes, if you insist, Mr. Cole. Uh, thank you. Huh. I don't recall telling you my last name. <laughs> You want another piece of pie, Elmer? Ho, oh, ho, oh, Nelly, no, Miss Maddie. If I was to try to stuff in another piece, I'd bust a seam. It was a dandy meal, though. I have another piece, Miss Maddox. All righty there, Cecil. Still trying to fill up that hollow leg, huh, Cecil? I got a weakness for sweet potato pie. Well, what you got a weakness for is desserts. If the whole meal consisted of sweet potato pie, it'd be fine with you, wouldn't it? Yeah, Elmer, yeah. Oh, boy, mm. I'm packed. I might have to pop me a butt. Me, too. Say, you haven't eaten a thing on your plate, Mr. D. Uh, Do you not like dumplings? Yes. It looks delicious, madam. I am not hungry, thank you. Say, can I have that hunk of pie, then? See, so watch your manner. Well, it'd be a shame to let it go to waste. What kind of work do you do, Mr. D? Well, madam, that is hard to say. Uh, m m Mr. D is a travel agent of sorts, Miss Maddie. Oh, oh, that must be exciting. 
No. No, madam, it is not. It is excruciating. The pain, the misery is overwhelming. What could be so bad about it? Oh. Uh, it it's, it's just the traveling getting to him a little, Miss Maddox. Uh, that's why he's down here. He's on vacation. Gonna try to rest up a bit. Well, Biloxi is definitely the place to do it. You just have yourself a good old time, Mr. D. Uh, thank you, madam. I will try to do that. In fact, I may quit my job soon. You're, You're going, going to, to do, do what? What? Bad gum, Jiminy Christmas. Oh. You hear that? Sound like oh. a car wreck outside. Merciful heaven. Sounded pretty bad to me. Hey, now look outside. It is a wreck. Lester Plunkett run his car into a persimmon tree. Bad gum, and he's walking up this way, too. Let's go see about him, Cecil. All right, Elmer. Ah. Lord have uh, mercy, Lester. Uh, you okay? Hit uh, your car's on fire. Yeah. I swore to miss an armadiller and my car hit that danged old tree over there. Heck, your head's busted wide open, Lester. You okay? Yeah, I feel a little dizzy, but I don't feel no pain. I can see your brain, Lester. See so. What a thing to say. Well, look at his head. You can see his brain clear as day. Oh, no. My car is wrecked. My wife is going to skin me alive. Well, she's far, Lester. You can worry about that later. we got to get you to Doc Stone right away. Oh, come on, Elmer. Is it really necessary? You're a-bleeding like a stuck pig. Of course it's necessary. Don't argue with me, Lester. Get in my truck. Okay. Mr. Corn. Yes, sir? Do you mind if I come along? Not at all, Mr. D. Come along. Come on, Lester. Get in my truck oh, right now. All right. Yeah. Open up real wide and say I for him. Yeah. Old Dr. Stone is getting up in years, ain't he, Elmer? Yeah, he's up in his age. Uh-huh. Uh, hush up, I want to see what he says about Lester. All righty. That's good, Les. Yeah. Uh, tell me, how bad does your head hurt? Well, it don't hurt at all. I feel a little bit sleepy, though. Ain't that his brain exposed, Dr. Stone? Well, I'm going to manage his head, Cecil. Uh, sit tight, Lester. Okay. I'll pick you up in a minute. I want to talk to Elmer for a second. Oh, is old uh, Lester going to be okay, Dr. Stone? Well, uh, that's kind of hard to say, Elmer. Huh. Uh, he ain't complaining of no pain. Uh, but according to my uh, instruments, he ought not feel nothing at all. Huh? Uh, what I'm saying is, uh, he ain't got no temp uh-huh. or blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, and he ain't got no pulse. Yeah. His skin's at room temperature and his eyes are dilated. Huh. Sounds like a dead man. Yeah, it does to me, too. Mm. I don't want to upset Lester. That's why I wanted to talk to you first about it. Yeah. Never seen nothing like it. Uh-huh. Not short of a horror movie. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll go patch him up. About all I can do at this point. Well, uh, okay, okay, uh, Doc. Uh, I'll see you later. Huh. Did you hear that, Mr. D? Yes, Mr. Corn, I did. Mr. Puckett has damaged his body beyond repair. Yeah. His nervous system no longer functions. Yet his life essence remains in his body. Life essence? You, you're talking about his soul? In a manner of speaking, yes. Hmm. His life essence cannot leave his body without my help. Oh, I see. I am dead. However, Mr. Pluckett will have to wait for his journey to the beyond. I am on vacation. Wait a minute. You mean you're just going to leave the poor fellow like he is now with his brain hanging out and all that? Yes. He will... Feel no pain, I assure you. Well, look at him, though. I mean, it ain't natural. I, what I'm saying is, if he's supposed to be dead... I I'm... do not wish to discuss it, Mr. Corn. I am enjoying my break. Oh, Mr. Death, we're about to go over Miller's Bridge, and it's pretty rickety. Mm. <laughs> 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 hey, uh, Tickety Manor, you pages will smoke it, Manor. Well, I guess this is your first time riding in a pickup truck, huh, Mr. D? Yes, Mr. Coy, it is. I gotta haul this manure over to Skeeter Phillips' house. Mm. After that, this truck will smell a heck of a lot better. I have no sense of smell. Oh, yeah? 
Well, you're a lucky fella. I tell you, the smell of fresh cow flop can make even the stoutest man weak in the knees. Breaking one now from the cow chip. You got your ears on out there? Huh. Yeah, somebody call me on the CB. Cow chip? <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, that's my handle. Well, kind of appropriate considering my job, don't you think? Yeah, you got the cow chip here. I, I copy it. Over. Yeah, this is Skeeter, Elmer. You bringing that cow flop over to my house? On my way, Skeeter. Why? Oh. Heck, I, I, I hope Miss Phillips ain't ailing. Well, she's up and going about now, but uh, yesterday she complained of chest pains. Checked her pulse, couldn't get one. Took her temperature, it's about uh, 75 degrees. Huh, 75 degrees, you say? Well, I guess you better take her to the doctor just to play it safe, Peter. I'll dump the manure in your backyard like you said. Thank you, Elmer. I'll pay you later. Over and out. Huh. Well, Mr. D, I, I guess Mrs. Phillips is in the same position that Lester Pluckett is in, ain't she? Yes, Mr. Cole. She had a fatal heart attack. Oh, that was a sweet lady, too. She's still walking around, though. I, I'll tell you something true, Mr. D. This whole thing's starting to sort of worry me a little bit. What concerns you, Mr. Cole? Well, it's this whole idea of dead people walking around like zombies. This sort of thing going on all over the world... Yes, of course. But you needn't be concerned, Mr. Cohen. They will not be in vain, and their bodies will not rot as long as their spirits remain in their bodies. Well, still, this sort of thing's liable to cause a worldwide panic. Well, what I'm getting at, Mr. D, is that, well, maybe you should get back to work pretty soon. Uh, no, Mr. Cohen, huh? I will never return to that position. Whoa! What? <laughs> Good gravy! <laughs> you can't be serious. You're quitting altogether? That is correct. Well, well, you can't do it. A world without death? My mind boggles at the thought. <sighs> I mean, the world would get overpopulated. My decision is final, Mr. Corden. But, but what about the, the spirits of the netherworld? You said they was coming after you. you. You said they'd find you sooner or later. Then I will refuse to go with them, Mr. Corn. Why? They cannot make me go. But... I am sick of death. Well, now you're acting just like a child. You can't just quit just like that. Mm. You just can't do it. You are dead. I was dead, Mr. Corn. Was. I am now Mr. Deathrow. Huh? Mr. Deathrow? Yes. You can't live in the real world like a person, Mr. D. Uh, You're transparent. Uh, there will be obstacles, of course. Uh, but I am prepared for them. I can't believe what I'm hearing. That's Cecil Ferris on the radio. He don't know to call me cow chip on the CB. Hello, Cecil. I read you. What's on your mind? Well, I'm so glad I got you. There's a hostage situation at the convenience store on Titus Street. Huh. Uh, some guy's trying to hold up the place. Hmm. And Dad Gammon, Albert, he's got Miss Maddox at gunpoint. Huh? Miss Maddox at gunpoint? He's got Miss Maddox hostage? Where's that, Cecil? It's at the quick pick, Albert. And Dad Gammon is there a swarm of police cars around there. Dad Gum, Did you hear that, Mr. D? Someone's got a gun to Miss Maddox's head at the quick pick. Check, we gotta get out there. <laughs> Uh, I rushed over as soon as I heard the news, Sheriff McElroy. Phil McCorn, what the hell are you doing here? There's a police blockade set up. I, I know, sir. I know. I broke it. I'm sorry, Sheriff, but Miss Maddox is like a mother to me, and I, I just had to see about it. Well, that guy's in there with her right now. Got a gun to her here. Seems pretty high strung. We can't risk going in there. Hey! Hey! Hey, you cops make one wrong move, and I blow this old broad head off. You understand? I want to get out of here. I want to get in my car and drive to the county line, and I'm taking Grandma here with me, you understand? Albert, take me, Albert! Now, the police will be waiting for you at the county line, mister. You stand away from that lady and drop that gun. It ain't going to do you no good. I've already reported this to the neighboring county. Hey, 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 you hasty cops think I'm stupid, huh? 
Now back off. I'm not making no deal. I'm in charge here. I'll open up a window to this chick's brain. I, I think this fellow's from out of state. Yeah, I know. He was holding up the quick pick just as me and Deputy Huckabee was driving up for donuts. Hey! He sees us and panics, grabs Miss Maddox. Hey, hey, what you talking about, cop, hey? We're just talking about maybe letting you go, mister. Uh, Roy, huh? I'm going to get my rifle. Uh, all right, sir. You going to try to take him out? Well, I got a pretty clear shot if I aim for his head. Well, uh, uh, should you try that, Sheriff? Well, if he sees that rifle, he's liable to try to shoot Miss Maddox. Oh, no, I've dealt with these nervous types. All talk and no action. Here's your rifle, Sheriff. All right. Here, hold my coffee and donut. All right, sir. Hey, hey, what's with the shotgun? You're making a big mistake, cop. All right, I got a bead on him. Back up, Elmer. I'm going to shoot him through the window. Mm. Ah, my head! Yeah, Bingo, Sheriff. Caught him right between the eyes. Caught him dead center. Ah, hey! Hey, you fat pig, you shot me in the head. It can't be possible. That man's still standing. Oh, Lord of mercy, I forgot to tell you, Sheriff. You can't kill him. You can't. Oh? What the heck are you talking about, Emma? This is a dad blame 12 gun. I don't care if it's an elephant gun. You can't kill him. Hey, hey, is this the best you cops can do, huh? You shoot me in the head, I don't feel nothing. Hey, <laughs> I can run around, I can skip around. Hey, you cops shooting with pop pistols? <laughs> I'm going to shoot him again. It wouldn't do you no good, Sheriff. I ain't got time to explain it to you. I'm going in there. Huh? Now, now you get back here, Emma Corn. You want your donut back here? That man has flipped his lid. Yeah, donut would taste good by about now. Now, now, mister, huh? you put down that gun. Huh. That lady you got with you there is an old friend of mine. Oh, well, that's real touching. That's real touching. I think I'm going to cry. I said put down that gun. Huh. Hey, hey, let go of my arm. Let go of my arm. Uh, holy guacamole. Elmer, you've been shot. Uh, he just got me in the shoulder, Miss Maddox. Oh, yeah? Well, I think I can do better than that. No, mister, don't do it. You can't kill me. A sheriff shot you in the head with a 12-gauge and you didn't die. Yeah. No one can die. What the hell is this moron talking about? Mr. Death. Mr. Death, you gotta stop this. You see what kind of world it's gonna be if you don't go back to work? Yes, Mr. Corn. I see. Somebody clue me in here. Who's this guy in the sheep? You know who I am, Mr. Raguso. Eh? Hey, how did you know my name? You are Bernard Shane Raguso. Yeah. And it is time to go. Yeah. Come with me now. Do uh. not fight it. No, stay away from me, you freak in the sheep. Rest. Rest, Mr. Raguso. Uh. It is time to rest. Uh, wait, hey, what's happening? Ah. Uh. Elmer, he just dropped like he was dead. He is dead, Miss Maddox. He is. Ed Gumman, Elmer, I thought you was a goner. I guess that gunshot in the head finally caught up with him. No, sir, Sheriff. Death caught up with him. Who's that better than the sheep? The sheep's still there, but the man's gone. Well, that was Mr. D. He had important matters to tend to. We've got to get you to the hospital, Elmer, right now. Uh, all right, Miss Maddox, we can do that. I guess things are going to get back to normal now. Now that Mr. Death is back to work. Well, now. And that was a close call, was it not? I mean, can you imagine a world without death? I'm a morgue attendant. I enjoy telling stories, but uh, death pays the bills. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, I'm afraid I must leave you now. I have to set out a poison for the rats in Corridor 3. <laughs> I so enjoy that. Uh, but please, uh, do return for another story, will you? Until then, pleasant dreams. You have just heard Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. Today's installment, Elmer Meets Death. 
for correspondence, send to MJ Audio Theater, P.O. Box 252, Mejia, M E X I A, Texas, 76667. The names and characters portrayed in this production are fictitious. Any similarities to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. by M&J Audio Theater. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's adventure, direct line to bombers, the story of an American OSS agent who, during the height of the war, directed from the streets of Berlin an American attack, is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. After you get back from a mission, you sit around and there's nothing to do but sit around. So that's what I did. I sat in a room in Milton Hall in England where OSS agents are trained. I thought about the restaurant on 6th Avenue I wanted to open after the war. I was never so bored in my life. Yeah. Hey, uh, Nicky, the colonel wants to see you. Very important. Okay, pal. Tell my pal the colonel I'll be there. And win the war for him. Da 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 da. And that was how it all began, in November 1944. After that, I didn't have time to be bored. I know you've just come back from a mission in France, Lieutenant, so it's strictly up to you if you want to go out again immediately. Oh, now listen, pal. I mean, uh, Colonel. <laughs> if I have to sit around here and do nothing, I'll blow my top. Uh, you um, speak German, don't you? Well enough to know that Hitler speaks a lousy German, full of grammatical errors. I, if I see him, I'll tell him. Eh? You may be closer to him than you think. Corporal? Yes, Colonel. Send in Professor Warburg. <laughs> That's how I met the professor. He was a little guy with a beard. He weighed about as much as 10 cents worth of liver. And he reminded me of my chemistry teacher back in Lincoln Junior High School. Professor, tell Lieutenant Olesnikos just what you told me. With the greatest of pleasure, Colonel. Lieutenant, I am an escaped political prisoner of the Nazis. And I am here in England illegally. And you just walked into headquarters and told that to the Colonel, huh? Do you know you can be interned? I know that very well. But I can no longer sit by and be idle while I have a plan that I know can help the Allies. Uh, what uh, Professor Warburg suggests, Lieutenant, is that he be parachuted into Germany with another agent, make his way to Berlin... I, uh, I assure you, I can move about Berlin blindfolded. I know it well. Berlin? This could be interesting. What then? Then, with a radio transmitter, we could pinpoint military targets to American planes overhead. We could direct bombs from the streets of Berlin itself. 
Now, wait a minute. Walk around with a walkie-talkie in the middle of a raid carrying on conversation with bombers? When do we leave, pal? I am ready any time. Today? Tomorrow? Yesterday? The professor may have been ready yesterday, but the OSS wasn't. First, we were briefed for weeks how to get food coupons in Berlin, how to buy a railroad ticket, how to post a letter, how to greet a German officer in the street. Little things, uh, an American cigarette, an English match, a laundry mark could give us away. And there were big things, too. We were grilled for hours on cover stories. Forgeries became documents. Fiction became fact. Passes, stamps, signatures. Everything authentic, everything ersatz, including my manners and habits. But I was ready to pass as a citizen of Berlin. And then a plane took us high over German soil, and we jumped. We made it, Nicky. Yeah. It's only a few kilometers to Berlin. We can walk it, make it before daylight. <laughs> we should find the farmer who owns this field and say Danke schön for providing us with so ideal a landing place. <laughs> yeah, we'll send him a letter sometime. Right now, let's get out of here. You will wait where you are. Kindly keep your hands in the air. Unless you want that I blow your heads off. Or that my dog tear you to bits. Quiet, Ron. You've been a good dog keeping so still. Well, as your farmer, Professor, you still want to say danke, sir? Sit still! Do not talk! You, uh, you have made a mistake, my friend. My companion and I got lost trying to find the road. We, we came by accident on your field. That's right. We both of us only recently discharged from the army. If you would care to see our papers right here in this knapsack... I... If you don't keep your hands up, I will let the dog go for your throat. I do not care to see your papers... I saw you parachute from an American plane. Uh oh. Walk now to the barn. Rolf will see to it that you stay there. Won't you, Rolf? The German farmer left us in the barn and he didn't have to lock the door. That big black Doberman with the impatient fangs watched us as if he wanted us to make a move so we could jump. <laughs> Oh, if we get out of this, my friend, I shall never again be a dog lover. Professor, don't move, don't turn your head, just listen to me. Yeah, I'm listening. There's some harness straps hanging on a hook right over my head. I noticed them when I came in. If I can pull them down fast enough, I'll throw them over the dog when he leaps, try to untangle him. Yeah, but... There's some horse blankets near you. When I pull down the straps, throw the blanket over him. It's got to be fast. Better work. I'm ready. On three, then. One. Nice, boy. Nice, nice, big, ugly mutt. Two. Three. The harness caught on the nail as I tried to pull it down. The dog leaped at my neck. And then the nail came off, too, and the straps fell across the dog's snout. The professor flung the blankets over the dog's head. I, I have him, Nicky, but I can't hold him. The shovel? Where's that shovel I saw? Hurry, hurry. I can't hold him. Now... I hit him again and again. And then suddenly the only sound in the barn was the dull thud of the shovel. The dog didn't move or make a sound. He never would again. We had better get out now. Yeah, let's go. The smell of a bakery is always good. Uh, how fortunate it is. I have only this morning made Pfefferkuchen, Josef. <laughs> Just the way you always liked it. <laughs> how good to see you again, Anna. I <laughs> told my friend Nicky that you would take us in, help us. Natürlich, Nicky. I will do anything I can. We, we may stay here then, huh, Anna? Oh. If all goes well, we will leave right after the raid tomorrow night. Yeah, 24 hours, all we need. Of course you may stay. I still live above the bakery. There is an extra room. My grandson Emil will not be home from the youth camp for a week. Yet. Youth camp? 
What could I do, Nicky? What could anyone do in these days in Berlin but ride with the wind? Until there is a chance to fight against it. Helping you and your mission will give me my chance. <sighs> Little Emil. Eight years ago seemed like only yesterday. I used to sit with him on my lap here in this bakery and twirl my gold watch on the chain for him. Uh, remember, Anna, how he laughed? Yeah, I remember. He has forgotten you by now. And you would not know him. He's 13 years old. Oh, 13 years old? Already they have poisoned his mind. I cannot get to him. I do not dare. He's a little parrot speaking only what is taught him. Ah... Uh, Nicky, some more coffee? No, thank you, Frau Leitner. More Pfefferkuchen or Apfelstrudel. A specialty of my shop, Apfelstrudel. No, thanks. <sighs> Six years ago, at this very table, I had Emil on my lap when the Gestapo walked in and arrested me. Yeah. They did not like what I taught in their school. Hey, what's that? Someone's coming. I don't know who it can be. Customers never come by this late. Grandmother, surprise, I'm home. Emil! What is, men? Emil, your manners. These are friends just uh, passing through Berlin. They are j just staying the night. This is Herr Neudek and Herr Josef. Wie geht's? Wie geht's? Heil Hitler. Oh, yes, of course. Heil Hitler. I did not expect you until next week, Emil. How is it you are here so early? Well, I won a great honor, which I want to tell you about. I did not know I'd have to share it with strangers. Shame, Emil. These men are... Well... Soldiers of the fatherland. Yeah? Yes, Emil, we were both with the elite guard of one of Rommel's panzer divisions. Oh, Rommel? Yes, uh, that is before we received our medical discharges. Oh, Rommel. <laughs> Sit down, my boy. I will bring you something to eat, yeah? Don't you want to hear about the honor I received? Look, grandmother, on my sleeve. A red swastika. Yeah, red for the youth movement. And a swastika because I learned my lessons faster than the others. The commander in chief of the whole youth movement awarded me my swastika, and he told me I could take my vacation a week early. Are you proud of me, grandmother? Yeah, my boy, yeah. Let me get you something to eat. Oh, no, 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 I'm too tired. Going up to bed. Grandmother said you're staying here. Will I see you in the morning, gentlemen? Well, I'm not sure. Oh, they will be here. Now that you are home, Emil, I will sleep on the couch and give them my room. No, no, please. Oh, it is all right. It is settled. Good. Perhaps then, Herr Josef, you will tell me about Rommel, a great leader. Yes, yes, perhaps. Uh, we will see you in the morning, Emil. Why do you stare at me? Do I stare, boy? I thought so. Have I met you before, Herr Josef? No, I am sure not. Your face... Ever since I came in. Grandmother, have I met him here before? No. No, Emil. Herr Josef was here before you were born, even. You have never seen him. It has been years. Oh, Fifteen, maybe. Before you were born. <laughs> I suppose so. Well... Good night. Professor... He wouldn't remember, would he? Oh, how could he, Nicky? He was a baby that last day Josef saw him, barely five years old. And the professor was 30 pounds heavier, at least, and clean-shaven. Yeah, yeah, Anna is right, Nicky. Do not worry. He could not remember. Do not worry. <laughs> I lay awake half the night thinking about that kid in the room next door. The 13-year-old puppet with the new red swastika. It was just a feeling. I had a funny kind of feeling at the pit of my stomach that made me wish they'd kept him in that youth camp until after we were gone. When I got up, the sun had been up for hours, and so had the professor. I went downstairs to the bakery. There was a smell of fresh bread baking, and I knew Frau Leitner was in the kitchen. But the professor was sitting at the table, swinging his watch on the gold chain and talking well, to that uh, German quiz kid. What else kid. have you learned, Emil? But why do you want to know? 
Oh, I am just interested. I want to see how well you have earned that swastika. I stood at the Come, bottom of the stairs me. and listened. We have our leader who has revolutionized Germany. Me. He is the greatest man who ever was or will be. When I joined the Führer's organization, the man in charge said, Join no other organization but this. Forward, forward, the banner leads us to eternity. Oh, well, you have learned your lesson well. Hmm? Herr Josef, are you sure I have never seen you before? Of course not, my boy. I seem to remember. Hey, Josef. Ah, good morning, Herr Neudeck. Uh, since we're just passing through Berlin, don't you think we ought to see a few of the, the sights before we leave? Yeah, yeah, you are right. We will leave now. Uh, perhaps later, Emil, we will talk more. The raid was scheduled for that night. The professor and I had a lot of work to do. We made arrangements to meet about 4.30 that afternoon at a tavern on Wilhelmstrasse. We went separate ways. I did a lot of walking. And I made a lot of notes in my head. The Klingenberg power plant was still functioning. The Ostkreuz junction of the city railroad had been repaired. There was an ammunition dump on the north side that our bombers couldn't see from the air. It's a nice day, a lot of Germans were walking the streets, and I made a lot of notes in my head. You wish to order now, mein Herr? Nein, nein, later. I am waiting for a friend. The professor was 15 minutes late, and I started getting nervous. Maybe somebody had recognized him. I sat there and sweated it out. Fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, half hour. And then he finally came. But he wasn't alone. Herr Neudeck, this is Hauptmann Müller. Hi. Hi. Uh, we, uh, we met only this afternoon and I uh, invited him to come and have dinner with us. <laughs> it was not quite that way, Herr Neudeck. It was I who insisted upon coming alone. I, uh, uh give it, sit down. You were with one of Rommel's panzer divisions, I understand. Yes, we were only recently discharged from the army. Myself, I am just back. <laughs> yeah, we will have much to talk about. Where is that stupid waiter? They're never around when you need them. Uh, he will be here presently. Uh, presently is not soon enough. I will go to see him myself. I'll be right back. Where did you pick him up? He found me, my friend. There is a reservoir near the rail line. I was looking around. I, I think he was a little suspicious at first, but when I told him I was with Rommel, he became more friendly. Yeah. I am beginning to believe I was in Africa myself. Just the same, I wish you could have shaken him. What did you find out? It was a profitable afternoon. And you? A profitable afternoon. Good. Shh, he comes back. <laughs> ah, yes. At first, it seems strange to me that Herr Josef here should show so much interest in the reservoir. <laughs> well, I, I was merely taking a stroll, getting reacquainted with Berlin. <laughs> then I watched you. I saw you walk down towards the rail line. That was when I stopped you and began to talk. We are both glad you did, Herr Hauptmann. Give us this opportunity to get acquainted. Yeah, yeah. Hope we shall see more of you while we're in the capital. Uh, perhaps, Herr Neudeck. Perhaps you shall see a great deal of me. I think I shall call the waiter and order some brandy. Oh, oh but I see you have not yet finished your meal, Herr Neudeck. You're still eating. It's very good. Our diet at the hospital was not so varied. No doubt, no doubt. Everything I ate stuck in my throat. I know what of the nurse. down. I knew that German officer was watching me as he talked. Watching me strangely, and I didn't know why. I knew that something was wrong, and I didn't know why. The professor felt it, too. Her name is Gertrude, this uh, little Fräulein I tell you about. And she has friends. Oh, some very pretty friends. Uh, you would like to meet them, perhaps? Yes, we would like to very much, Herr Hauptmann. <laughs> Ah, oh, you would have enjoyed them. We might have had great fun together. All of us. 
Unfortunately, you may be otherwise engaged with the Gestapo. What? What? What did you say, Herr Hauptmann? I have been watching you all through dinner, Herr Neudeck. You are an American. Do not I... move, either of you. I have my hand on my gun. Well, surely you're, j- you're joking. No, European. It's the way you do. To change the fork from the left hand to the right after the knife is used. At first, it escaped me. I just knew something bothered me. Then I realized what it was. It did there it, it was. The little but thing that could put a rope around Only my neck. Americans hold the fork sideways in the right hand. In my nervousness, I'd forgotten I a little the thing like that European yeah. manner of eating. The will be very pleased. The sharp knife I'd been eating with was still in my hand. Almost as if it moved by itself, it disappeared under the table and halfway into the German office. Good work, Mickey. Good. I was stupid to get myself into that jam in the first place. We're not out of this yet. Waiter. Waiter. Yeah, mein Herr. Check, please. Our friend has had a little too much to drink. We will take him home. Yeah, yeah, right away. Between the two of us, we managed to get him out of there. His head was rocking back and forth like a drunk. The knife was still in him, so the blood didn't flow very much. He kept his cape around him. All right. There is no one around here, Nicky. We can dump him behind this shed. All right. We're beginning to leave a trail a mile long. (coughs) So long, pal. It was nice meeting you. Come on, Professor. Let's go. Back to the bakery, there was more trouble waiting for us. Trouble 61 inches high, weighing about 110 pounds, wearing a new red swastika on his arm. Uh, they're in the kitchen. Something is wrong. I don't like the sound of that. Come on. This morning when we were at watch on the chain, I thought I remembered something, and just now how I feel. Oh, you have never seen Herr Josef before, I Emil. Have, I have, when I was very little, the Gestapo came. They arrested a man with a gold watch on a chain. I tell you, he is the same one. Emil, they do not even look alike, and What about po- this, this broadcast radio I found hidden in your bedroom in a hat box? I, I... It's called a walkie-talkie, Emil. What? Give it back to me. Nicky! Joseph, come back. You see, you see, we've wasted time. I should have gone to the authorities right away. They have tricked you, grandmother. He knows, Anna. I'm afraid so. I've been holding him here, hoping he would return. What did you say? You knew grandmother, didn't you? They didn't trick you at all. Traitor. You're a traitor, too. Amy, get Amy, away from me. I hate you. Me. I hate you. Nicky, get, get him. Away. He's trying to Amy. run. Yeah, I got him. Let me go. Let me go. I report to the Gestapo. They kill you. They have you shot. I'm not going to report oh. anyone. What will I do with him? Uh, upstairs. Me. His bedroom. Oh, Lock him there until after you have gone. Right. Let go of me. Get your hands on me. I hate you. I hate you all. Let me go. You will have to come with us when we leave here tonight, Anna. You cannot stay now. The professor is right, Frau Leitner. That kid upstairs will turn you over to the Nazis so fast you won't know what happened to you. My little Emil, turn me in. Josef, would he? Yeah, I'm afraid he would, Anna. It is best that you come with us. We are going to try to get through the lines into France. Once there, there are underground workers who will help us. Yeah. Nikki. Is it all right if I bring this tray of food up to him? He has not eaten. He's still such a little boy. Yeah, sure, sure, you... Oh, right, take it up, but don't untie his hands, remember? Yes, I will remember. Well, the raid ought to start soon. Let's go over this map, make sure we have everything right, huh? Yeah. Now, the rail line is here. Mm-hmm. Sector 2, grid B3. If our bombers knock that out, Berlin's transportation is completely crippled. And here, on the map, power plant is in sector 6, grid G5. Rosie, Mickey, he's gone. What did you... What? <laughs> yeah, his hands. He got them loose. He lowered himself from the window with the bedsheet. What are we to do? He'll bring the Gestapo back with him. We don't know how long he's been gone. Professor, the window, quick. Yeah. The, uh, ah, the back door. There, there is a car coming. I there can is, see it. There is an alley and Now, look, can... look, no time. They'll have this place surrounded. How do you get to the roof? The roof, yeah, yeah. Up those stairs. We can go to, to the other rooftops and perhaps escape. There better be no perhaps about it. 
We went up to the attic stairs and onto the roof. You could see the Germans from there. Four of them in black shirts spilled out of an armored car. Two of them broke in through the front door. Two of them started around to the rear. And then we heard Amy. Nikki, Nikki, she's dead. Well, it won't do her any good if we stay here. Come on, across the parapet. Eric. Oh, that's music to my ears. At least it'll keep them from getting more help right now. Stay where you are. Surrender now and it will go easier with you. Come and get us, pal. One of them did try to come and get us. And he got it first. Right between the eyes. He swayed for a few seconds back and forth, and then he fell off the roof onto the street. Ah, that's one of them, Nikki. There are only two left. Two? Well, what happened to the third? Nikki, was... behind you! Fourth Nazi had come up the other way, through somebody else's attic and onto the roof behind. Get your hands up! Now there are just two left, Professor. I... Hey, Professor, what is it? My... my leg. I can't move it. I can't go any further, Nikki. <laughs> What happened afterwards was a nightmare. It was if the earth cracked wide open. It was red hot and burning, and the noise of the planes and the akak and the German guns and the bombing made my my stomach turn. We crouched behind a parapet, and I held them off while the professor directed the bombers. Attention! Attention, bombers! The Klingenberg power plant is still functioning and supplies electric power to vital industries. Bomb sector 6, grid G5. The Ostkreuz junction of the city railroad has been repaired. Knock it out and all traffic in Berlin will be stopped. Sector 2, grid B3. All right, go now, Nikki, while there is a chance. I can hold them off long enough for you to get away. I can't leave you here. No, no, they won't take me. Don't worry. Now look, I'll carry you. We'll make it. Come on. Listen. Listen to me, Nikki. Go across the next two rooftops and then down through the skylight. There is a tailor shop. Yeah, but Professor... Go out the back door there. It leads to an alley. Once over the fence, under cover of the raid, you can make it. Now look, I won't go without you. All right. I will change your mind. Attention. Attention, bombers. Hey, what are you doing? Attention, bombers. Imperative. Wait two minutes and bomb crossroads at sector seven, grid D3. Hey, Professor, what are you doing? You're crazy. That's here, this sector. Go on, run. Run, Nikki. I'll cover you. <laughs> I stumbled and fell and got up and ran again. When I got down in the alley through the tailor shop, I kept on running. And then the bomb fell and the concussion rocked the ground and I went flat on my face. When I looked back, I knew that our bombers had made another direct hit. The professor had not only held off the Germans while I got away, but had kept them there until it was too late for any of them. A little German bakery that specialized in Apfelstreudel folded up as if it had been made of matchsticks. Somewhere in the wreckage, the professor with his gold watch on the chain was buried under it. And overhead, the planes headed back. There was nothing left for me there. I headed back, too. Lieutenant Gus Olesnikus made his way to France and after months from there to England. But his direction of the bombing raid from the target itself kept some of Berlin's major industries crippled and its transportation system paralyzed. And once again, the report of an OSS agent closes with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen next week when we again present... Cloak and Dagger. in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure were Everett Sloan, Bill Zuckert, Lily Darvoss, 
Barry Kroger, Michael Artist, Raymond Edward Johnson, Carl Weber, Jerry Jarrett, Bobby Weil, and Brad Barker. Script was written by Winifred Wolf and Jack Gordon. Music was under the direction of John Gart. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This has been a Lewis G. Cowan production in association with Alfred Hollander and was under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. about this world of ours, and ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. The manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes Take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Good evening, friends of the Creaking Door. The Creaking Door is opening. So do come in. My friend, but a word of warning. Once you've crossed the threshold, don't look over your shoulder too quickly. The things you would see would stay with you for the rest of your unnatural life. <laughs> Get three fives. Get the taste. Three fives by State Express. Get the taste of international success. The taste that's uniquely three fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so light, so smooth, so satisfying. Three fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made three fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get three fives. Get the taste. The old inn huddles in a row of ancient houses as if against the cold wind from the lake. The battered signboard groans in the wind. They say the place is haunted and strange things happen there. But there is nothing supernatural about the police inspector. He sits in an upstairs bedroom talking to the lady of the house. Mrs. Barton, exactly when did these uh, manifestations first take place? I don't expect you to believe me. Nobody will believe me. Certainly can't expect the police to inspect us. Oh, we aren't hard to convince, Mrs. Barton. Just tell the story your own way. My husband's name was Don. Donald Barton, if that was his real name. We traveled miles to see this hotel. He was captivated by it, or said he was. He's worked very hard since we took the place. And uh, the hauntings, or whatever you'd like to call them? They began the very first day, Inspector. I found out that they'd been there all the time, from the earliest days. Hmm. What form did they take? Uh, ghosts? Uh, spooks? The old wine cellar was haunted by poltergeists. Noisy ghosts. Earth spirits, some call them. You'd hear them rolling barrels down there. There was crazy laughter. Once we found iron. Little bits of it. Still smoking. Yes, smoking iron thrown all over the place. I see. Now, Mrs. Martin, suppose you tell me what happened from the time you woke up on the day of my first visit here. All right, Inspector. 
My husband went to market early to buy provisions for the hotel. He got back just as I woke up. I remember putting on a dressing gown and picking up my slippers. It was then I noticed that there was mud on them. Awake at last, eh? Oh, I had a rotten night. Oh, I suppose I did, Don. I hardly slept. Don, look at my slippers. All covered in dried mud. Yes, well, that's odd. It must have been wet mud, I suppose, when somebody used them. But who? It was raining last night. (laughs) Who do you suppose could have used your slippers, Selma? Oh, you... You mean me? Uh, I I suppose I did. Oh, Don. Don, please... Let's get away from here. No, this is far too good a little business to leave, Selma. It isn't. You know it isn't. I, I was never like this before. Before? Before what, Selma? I never walked in my sleep or, or picked up things in the garden. Never. Not until I came to this hotel. It's, it's haunted, Don. I know it is. Oh, nonsense, darling. Now, you'd better see a doctor. No. No. You remember last time. Yes, but so what? You picked up a dead frog in the garden and put it in your pocket. It was horrible. Slimy and cold and dead. Oh, and, and I was so horrid to you, Don. Oh, that doesn't matter. I suspected that you and Beatrice... Yes, I know, I know. Poor Beatrice. I may have little taste, my dear, but I don't have affairs with the staff. Would you swear it isn't true that you've never been friendly with Beatrice? Oh, please, dear. Then get rid of her. You forget this pub is supposed to be haunted. I just can't get stuff. If I... If I asked you nicely, Don, would you get rid of Beatrice? No. She's done nothing wrong. She works very hard. She doesn't want the earth. And she's very pretty. Oh, in a coarse peasant fashion, I expect she is. Oh, is it me, Emma? Am I going mad? No, of course not. No, don't say such absurd things. What's that? Fire brigade, police, ambulance. I'll open the curtain. Have a look. Oh, it's an ambulance. Stopping outside Mrs. Flowers' place. I hope she isn't ill, even if I don't like her. Oh, come, come. She's an old lady. Um, she called me a witch. I suppose she's seen me tramping around in my nightgown. Something like that. Oh, well, tell me. Sleep in if you want to. Now, I'll have to get down and start breakfast. Please, Beatrice. There you are, Don. Oh, thanks, Ray. Uh, coming. I'll see who that is, me. Okay. Yes, sir. Good morning. May I see you, old happy? Well, see you, then. Are you a commercial traveler? No, I'm not. I'm a police officer. Oh, you better come in, then. This is Mr. Barton. Don, he says he's a police officer. Oh, thank you. Good morning to you, sir. My name is Hunter, Inspector Hunter. Uh, morning to you. What a very appropriate name. A hunter of men, eh? I suppose so, sir. Might have a word with you in private, sir. Uh, of course you can. Uh, come through to the parlor, Inspector. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Excuse me, down, Thank you, sir. I've called for a little information, if that's possible, sir. I'm sorry to say Mrs. Flowers, the lady who lived opposite you, was murdered last night. Murdered? Mrs. Flowers? Now, why should anyone want to kill Mrs. Flowers? She's a... She was an old woman. Robbery? Well, that's just it, sir. No. I called to ask if you knew of any enemies who might have disliked Mrs. Flowers enough to kill her. I don't think she had an enemy in the world. Huh. I suppose you saw nothing suspicious last night. No, Inspector. I go to bed early. I have to be up for the market early in the morning. Mr. Barton, I believe your wife had a quarrel with Mrs. Flowers. Oh, hardly a quarrel. Well, they had words. I think my wife called her an interfering old busybody, and she called my wife a witch. I see. Uh, What was the occasion of this exchange of words? I believe some of the local men had been having rather a noisy party in the saloon bar. Mrs. Flowers called in the next morning to complain. That's all there was to it. Could I talk to your wife for a moment, Mr. Barton? She's sleeping. She was very tired last night. Uh, Would you mind terribly calling back later in the day, Inspector? No, 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 not at all. That'll be perfectly all right, Mr. Barton. Thanks. I don't suppose she'll be able to tell you anything. 
It was only the briefest of women's quarrels. Not really bitter. Mm-hmm. Certainly not any excuse for strangling Mrs. Flowers. Very well, sir. I'll be over later. Oh, good. This way, Inspector. All right. I just thought your wife might be able to help me. But, uh, goodbye for now, sir. Oh, well, Inspector. See you later. Already what? Mrs. Flowers across the road was killed last night. Killed? Murdered. No. Oh, we're not safe in old beds. That will not... Oh, shut up, B. Of course we are. I'll have to go up and tell Thelma. Oh, she'll just go all weepy. Why bother? And because she's my wife, and somebody's got to tell her. He told me then. I suppose he gave me good advice. But I couldn't see it at the time. Of course, I was shocked by the murder of poor Mrs. Flowers. I didn't like her, and she'd called me a witch in a spiteful tone. But I, I never hated her. I was remembering the mud on my slippers, remembering the dead frog and the other incident. I was frightened, Inspector. Especially the first time you spoke to me. Uh, now, Mrs. Barton... You say you knew the dead woman only slightly. That's right, Inspector. But on one occasion, she called you a witch. Yes. There was some sort of noise in the hotel, and Mrs. Flowers objected to it. Mm. Was she always so objectionable? Oh, no, no. Inspector, she was an old woman. Rather crotchety, that's all. Mm, I see. Now, I've heard this place is haunted. Oh, country people do talk. Uh, They exaggerate. But I'm told you said the place was haunted. Oh, no. You must be mistaken. Mrs. Martin, tell me, please. uh, Do you walk in your sleep? No. Oh, no, never. I see. I rather thought you did. No, no, of course not. Have you been told to say all this? Oh, no, how, how could you Well, that's be... all right, madam, that's all right. It won't make much difference in the end. But tell me, have you seen or heard any unusual things recently? Well, yes. At night, a, a strange figure, hmm? the shadow of a strange figure has crossed the blind quite often. What kind of figure? The figure of a woman. It has a tall headdress with a figure of the crescent moon on top. The first time I saw it, I ran to the window... But the street outside was empty. Oh, just a trick of the light, surely, Mrs. Martin. Perhaps. But you see, I live on the first floor. Nothing, nothing could throw a shadow there. Get three fives. Get the taste. Three Fives by State Express. Get the taste of international success. The taste that's uniquely Three Fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so light, so smooth, so satisfying. Three Fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made Three Fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get three fives. Get the taste. Well, well, well. A ghost, you think? The kind of ghost that haunts public houses is, of course, an inspector. Inspector. <laughs> But let's go over to the inn. Oh, there we are, sir. I'd like lunch, please. The cottage table, sir. Thank you. The cottage pie is very nice, sir. Oh, I'll have that. Get me a mild and bitter, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, Beatrice. Yes, Mr. Henson. Uh, look, you know this district better than anybody, don't you? Oh, well, I wouldn't be that, sir. Know anybody that would wish old Mrs. Flowers any arm? I don't know, I'm sure. Of course, the missus here didn't like her. Mrs. Barton. Oh, I don't expect there's anything in that, though. Mrs. Flowers called Mrs. Barton a witch, didn't she? That's right, she did. Tell me, Beatrice, uh, does that mean anything to you? Oh, I know. It's just a manner of speaking. You've never heard tell of a, of a coven of witches in the neighborhood? What an imagination you've got. <laughs> coven of witches, whatever next. Uh, Beatrice, just a minute. Oh, sorry. I'm very busy just now, sir. Oh, indeed. Too busy to help me solve a very strange murder. Feeling any better, Zelda? Just the sky. 
must be a headache. I am sorry. Oh, Doc, am I mad? Am I imagining things? Oh, what a question. Of course not. You, you aren't too fond of Beatrice? Oh, don't start harping on that again. Now, let's make it quite clear. No, you're not mad, Selma, but you're eccentric and neurotic, if you like. But so are thousands of people. You think I'm neurotic because I saw something on the stairs? A grey hooded figure? It was your imagination. The mud on my slippers, that was real enough. Did you get rid of the mud? No. Why should I? My dear girl, the woman across the road was killed. Your slippers have mud on them. You see weird shadows at night. Now, please, don't let the police get suspicious. Why not? Because they haven't much sense and they're like bulldogs. Try explaining to them the difference between a neurosis and a psychosis. So, you think I killed her? Of course not. Why did she call you a witch, by the way? Oh, there's supposed to be a group of witches somewhere near here. A coven, I think they call it. Don, tonight's Sunday, isn't it? Yes, it's my fishing night. Don't go tonight, Don. I'm sorry, I have to. I promised the boys. You mean you promised the girls? Yes, sir. Oh, no, not that again. I'm sorry, Don, but, but please, don't go tonight. I must. Sorry, Selma, but I can't tell Johnny and Sam, the chaps I go with at this late hour. You've left it far too late. I'm not mad and I'm not a fool. I've been having you watch, you... Don. How long has this been happening? All last week. Someone from the private detective agency. Oh, you fool. What am I know you've been seeing Beatrice. I suppose I can't blame you. She's prettier, younger, too. So you've been spying on me. I had a right, Don. I'm your wife. Beatrice isn't the only woman under your spell, is she? Tell me, how much do you know? Enough. Why did you marry me? Money? I had to have this dress. But it loses money, Don. Everybody this says... This is the crown and mitre, built on the site of an ancient Cistercian abbey. The abbot was named Cantior. That's where the name comes from, I think. Crown and mitre. But I still don't see... Don't my... you? The figure you saw on the stairs. The red-hot lumps of metal that fly across the cellar. The bones spilled from nowhere. Don't you even recognize poltergeist phenomena? You've never seen a ghost before. The place is haunted. I know that. I felt it all along. My dear Thelma, why do you think I wanted the crown and mitre? I never could understand. Witches never exist alone. In every coven, worshipping the dark prince who existed before your silly beliefs, there is a man. Call him a wizard. Oh, ridiculous. You can't believe that old nonsense. You've had me watched. You must know. I am master of a coven of witches here in this village. Witches are only foolish when they pretend to... Possibly. More fool them. They are bound forever to the rule of the old dark prince. What you mean is the devil. Why don't you say it? The devil. You know nothing of the mystery. Mystery, you call it. Please, Don... Give up this madness, I beg you. Please, will you? Give it up. It's madness. Let me tell you what I shall do. Tomorrow is the night of the new moon. You talk to me of madness, but it is you who will become mad, not I, Selma. Become. You are mad. You are suspected of murder. The mesh is closing round you. You will spend the rest of your life cooped up as an idiot in an asylum. Or in jail. I can tell them, Don. I can say what really happened. Will you tell them that I am the master of a coven of witches, that you have done nothing? Will anyone believe you? I think they will. It might be easier to close your mouth forever. You dare not, Don. My death will come too soon after hers. After the death of Mrs. Flowers. You couldn't explain it. You killed yourself in remorse. Why, you... you... Tonight, the coven will attempt the feat I have set them. I shall lead them in the task of raising the spirit of the long-dead abbot, Cantior. What are you saying? Yet his ghost walks with the poltergeists who throw hot rocks and burning irons. I know what I'm saying. I shall raise that lonely gray ghost and set it against you. You will face me in the morning, my dear. Your reason gone. I shall be your sorrowful husband. Inspector Hunter, he won't be... He won't he, won't he. Your history, everything about you points to you. Besides, they think you killed Mrs. Flowers. You did? Of course. She knew too much. Her niece, young Lisa, was one of our initiates who failed to stay the course. 
Lisa told what she knew to her aunt, the flowers woman, who thought you were a witch. I had no alternative but to kill her. But I was going to say, I have power, my dear wife. Power. Power I shall wield tonight. And all with your money, my dear. You and Schumann swine. Look. Look at me. Look at me. Look into my eyes. Repeat after me. I am Thelma. I am Thelma. Thelma means that there is only one law. The law is do as thou wilt. Repeat it. I am Thelma. I am Thelma. Thelma means... Oh, no. No. Uh, Mrs. Barton, who are you? Beatrice. Go. Please, go away from me. Listen, Mrs. Barton. You are one of my husband's followers. Never. I thought it was a sort of joke. I thought it was all a big deal, this dressing up as spooks and all that. But it isn't. Oh, can I trust you? Look, Don's down there in the cellar now, where they used to have the old abbey. He's carrying on something shocking. I think somebody called Diana to listen to him. Diana, goddess of the moon. Here, you're not another of them, are you? Of course not. I've read about these things, that's all. Well, that's a good thing. <gasps> Look! Now you know why I'm half mad. You see that shadow? The shadow at the window? It's a woman with something on her head. Passed in like a woman's funeral. Diana, the moon goddess. Oh, help us. Help us. Oh, oh look, it's the old abbot. No. He said, Don said, it's growing stronger. The abbot. Abbot, can't you? If you are a good man, give us strength. Please. I beg you. Hello, Mr. Andrew. Oh, Mr. Andrew, get me out of here. Oh, you see nothing but ghosts all night. All life. right, all right, all right. That makes two of you, huh? Yes, two of us. I know that you won't believe me, that the lies my husband tells will win. But we've seen some terrible things these last few hours. Mrs. Barton, your husband probably faked all this mud on your slippers, bits of red-hot iron flying about, all that sort of thing. And the shadow of Diana, the moon goddess. Uh, some curious trick of the light, Mrs. Barton. And the ghost of the old abbot. Probably your wrought-up imagination. I promise you I don't believe your husband, madam. Then you'll protect me from it. Arrest him. Your husband killed Mrs. Flowers. How did you know that? He told me that Mrs. Flowers had been strangled when I first questioned him. Now, no one could have known that then. No one who hadn't seen the body. Oh, it's all so horrible. Well, it's over for you, Mrs. Barton, I promise you. Your husband was found dying in the old wine cellar by two of my men this morning. Dying? Aye, perhaps it's best this way. I'd hoped for a confession from him, but he only babbled some of his nonsense about uh, Diana. He must have believed it all. I've never seen a man look so terrified. I don't know what the coroner will say, but if you ask me, I think he died from terror. And the goddess spared me. Mrs. Barton, you had a stronger power than your husband. What do you mean, Beatrice? You protected me. Took me into your room. Maybe you suspected me even then. You saw I was frightened. Anyone would have done the same. Well, I'm only a country girl. But all the same, I saw what I saw. And I remember where it says, And the greatest of these is charity. Don Barton is in the ancient wine cellar, lying among the spirits, as it were. Must be the only public house 
whether who is a ghost. <laughs> Manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present The Creaking Door. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio